Hello everyone, my name is Mabeen and I am Samda co-president alongside Zibad. We will be your hosts for this evening. And I am currently a third year medical student studying at Barts and the London School of Medicine and Dentistry. I would like to give you all a warm welcome to the students, the parents and the teachers who have joined us. I really hope you are all well and staying safe. So welcome to our clinicians evening where we will have a series of exciting talks ahead of us. Remember that this event is open to all, so do please share the YouTube live stream link to anyone who will benefit. You can scan the QR code on screen using your phone or copy and paste the YouTube link. Hi everyone, a very warm welcome for me as well to all the students, parents and teachers that have joined us this evening. My name is Zibad and I'm going to kick off this presentation by starting off with talking about who exactly we are and what kind of work we get involved with. Well, first of all, SAMDA stands for Student Assisted Medical and Dental Applications. And we are a student run society based at Barts in the London Queen Mary School of Medicine and Dentistry. We dedicate ourselves to support sixth form students in East London as they embark on applying for a medical or dental degree. And we also provide highly motivated students that have the academic ability with the support that they require to support to secure a place at medical or dental school. Next slide, please. So what exactly is our aim? Well, at SAMDA, we try and increase the opportunity for sixth form students to apply to medicine or dentistry, regardless of their background. We provide students with crucial support from year 12 all the way through to year 13 by providing guidance on writing the perfect personal statement, UCAT, BMAT preparation, and interviews, both panel and MMI style. Another event of ours that will be taking place in the near future is Skills Day. Here, we will help you boost your UCAS application by providing workshops on writing a personal statement and preparing you for the all important entrance exams. Next slide, please. So what do we have planned for the future? Well, as well as our skills day, which I've just mentioned, we have loads more events lined up for you. Firstly, we have our school visits. Now, if you attend one of the 25 schools that we've reached out to this year, then a group of existing medical or dental students will be visiting your school to help you with your UCAS applications to medicine and dentistry. We also have mock interviews that are held in the autumn and our buddy scheme will involve us pairing you guys up with a current medical or dental student for continuous support. Our weekly tips are already well underway where we have covered topics such as personal statement, extracurricular activities and work experience. So be sure to follow us on social media and have a look at all of these tips as well as receive all the future tips that we have lined up for you guys. Lastly, we are hoping to host tours of our anatomy lab in Mile End later in the year. So there's much to look forward to. Now, of course, owing to the current pandemic, things are uncertain and unpredictable, but we as a committee will be working hard to deliver these events in some way or form. Next slide, please. So moving on to today and what to expect from this evening. Well, we have a series of insightful and inspiring talks lined up for you. Our associated clinicians, dentists and alumni from our School of Medicine and Dentistry will be delivering presentations on an insight into dentistry, life as a dental student, introduction to medicine, life as a medical student, a career in medicine and the application process. We'll also be ha having a question and answer session at the end of the presentation, as well as at the end of each individual presentation so that you guys can ask all the questions that you might have. Also, do stick around right till the end where after completion of a feedback form, you will get access to your certificate for attending the event, as well as our guide to applying for medicine and dentistry, lockdown edition. Next slide, please. So I've just mentioned the guide. What's that guide all about? Well, our committee have all worked really hard to compile a document to help you apply for medicine and dentistry during this difficult and uncertain time. We've covered several topics, as you can see in this slide, that will surely be useful for you now and in the next few months. And you can get access to this resource at the end of the talks that are delivered today. Next slide, please. 
Okay, um, so the financing your degree talk given by Miss Lizzie Pollard is unfortunately cancelled as she was unable to make um, the talk today. However, she has shared some resources which will help you guys with the finance side of things. Um, so we have attached a document that she has provided at the end of the feedback form. So make sure you fill, it, uh, fill that in at the end of the talk to access the resources. Um, also, the link to the website um, and gives further information. And if you need one-to-one -one advice on finance, there is a web form that you can fill in where a member of staff will be able to assist you. And again, we will provide these links at the end of the feedback form. So please stay tuned uh, till the very end where we'll give details of how to access that. Okay, so this is just a quick slide on what to do if you guys have any concerns and want to report any issues. It also shows some of the safeguarding measures we have put in place, but hopefully no one will have to refer back to this, fingers crossed, and everything runs smoothly. So as we have under 18s in our audience, we have had to limit the interaction by turning YouTube comments off. However, we do want to make it as interactive as possible. So we will be using a platform called Mentimeter for you guys to ask questions and interact on. And I'll go through that on the next slide on how to um, do that. So when asking questions, don't put any personal information or use uh, any inappropriate language. It's just the standard things. Um, we, will, uh, we will be able to see your questions. So the panel will be able to uh, see your questions and then we'll answer them at the end uh, in the Q&A. Uh, if anyone has any concerns in terms of reporting inappropriate activities such as bad language or, for example, younger students being contacted by older students, then email us uh, with a school teacher attached uh, at the email samda at bartslondon.com so we can escalate as necessary. Um, but hopefully we have put measures in place so uh, we can avoid all of this. Um, finally, just a note on social media, um, please do uh, follow us on social media where we will be posting uh, weekly tips on uh, the, the application process. But if you have any questions regarding SAMDA events or the application process, um, just email us with the teacher copied in and we'll happily answer your questions as we can't respond to, question, uh, to queries on social media. Okay, so how to ask questions throughout the event? Um, we'll be using a platform uh, called Mentimeter for you guys to be uh, to ask questions. Uh, so if you guys can go to www.menti.com and enter the code 517787. And what I will do is I will open the Q&A after each speaker's talk for you guys to answer questions, uh, for, uh, to ask questions. And then the questions will be reset for each talk. Um, there will also be an opportunity to ask questions at the end for a general Q&A, just in case you miss um, asking questions at the end of each talk. So um, let's um, test this out. So I want some audience participation. So if you guys can go to Mentimeter, uh, www.menti.com uh, and type in the code 517787. And what I want you to do is submit three qualities that you think that a good doctor or dentist has. And we will come back to you what, on what you guys have come up with uh, later on in the talk. Okay, so I will just show you how the platform works. Just bear with me. So yeah, um, here are the instructions. What I want you guys to do is just type in three qualities of what you think a good doctor or dentist has. And these are the instructions. You can either use the QR code, just take out your phone and, uh, and open the camera and scan the QR code, or you can go to www.menti.com and type in the code 517787. Okay. We'll just get back to the tool. Okay, thank you everyone. That's the end of our presentation. Just a quick reminder, do follow us on our social media platforms to stay up to date with 
weekly tips amongst many other things and future events. Now we'll be moving on to our first presentation of the evening. So if we can go on to the next slide. Our first presentation is Life as a Dental Student by Murray. And bear with us for a moment whilst we just bring up the slides for the talk. Okay, can everyone hear me? Can everyone see my slides? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So thank you, Samda, for inviting me to speak at this event. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, I'm going to be talking about my journey in uh, dental school. So firstly, just a bit about myself. Um, so my name is Murray. Uh, I joined BARTS in uh, 2015, uh, straight from school. And I've just passed my finals exams in uh, this month. Uh, so hopefully this presentation can give you a, a bit of an insight um, on what dental school is like from a student perspective. So first year, this is a really, really exciting year. Um, you meet a lot of new people and especially if you're living out, which I did because I'm not from London, um, it's a really, really great year. But it's also quite a challenging year. So in the first couple of weeks, you'll have freshers weeks where you'll meet lots of new people um, and you'll go on lots, lots of different uh, kind of events and it's a really, really fun time. Um, with regards to the academic side of first year, um, there are a lot of lectures. So um, this might seem a bit daunting at first um, to get used to, but if you pass your A-levels and you've got into dental school, it shouldn't be a problem. Another main part of first year is societies. So there's loads of different societies. At BARTS, there's hundreds uh, of different societies that you can join. Uh, it's a great way to meet new people again, and um, it's it's nice to kind of take your mind off the course as well. So in first year, I joined the Rowing Society um, because it's something that I'd never done before, and I felt that it would be good to try something new. With regards to uh, assessments and exams, we have something called ICAs, which are in-course assessments. And they were kind of timetabled um, throughout the year just to make sure that we were keeping on top of the lectures. Um, they don't count towards your final grade, but you do have to pass them. But as I said earlier, if you passed your A-levels and got into dental school, you shouldn't have a problem um, passing these. So this is a photo uh, from me back in first year. And uh, this is my clinical partner, Hoiting, and one of my good friends, Krish. Uh, unfortunately, in first year, we don't see patients, but we are on clinic. And um, when we're not having lectures, um, we get to kind of practice things on each other, like doing checkups and um, ba basic practical uh, elements of dentistry. So it was nice to um, get hands on early in first year, which was, which was really good. Uh, moving on to second year. So in second year, it's um, pretty similar to first year. There's a lot of lectures again, so pretty uh, academic based. Um, but we have a very, very large module on medicine and dentistry. And um, because as dentists, we need to know how the rest of the body works and how it affects the mouth. Um, for this, we got sent to Newham Hospital, which is pictured here. And this is a great place to see all kinds of different patients. Th these aren't just dental patients. We actually shadow doctors and see how they kind of manage different patients and how they took medical histories. And we got to take medical histories of the patients as well. So that was a, a nice little um, thing in second year that we did. Also a big part of second year is the dental labs. So I've got a couple photos um, later on, which I'll show you. And this is when you really start practicing your practical skills of dentistry. So we um, started on the so-called phantom heads. Uh, which are uh, false teeth, essentially. And we kind of got used to handling the equipment that we'd use for um, doing basic fillings and things like that. 
Um, also in second year, we start seeing our first patients, which is very, very exciting. And that's towards the kind of final portion of the year. And um, the good thing about BATS is that the way we handle our patients is we take on a patient um, from the very start of the treatment plan, and we see that patient throughout their course of treatment. So we we'll, we get a nice kind of continuation of care, which is uh, which some unis don't have. Uh, this is uh, just a couple of pictures of the dental labs that I was talking about. So these are the phantom heads and the false teeth um, that you'd be drilling on in second year. Um, and this is my colleague Anjum. This was this was actually in fifth year, but again. This is the kind of thing uh, we'd be doing. And we have uh, great equipment at Bart's actually. We've got nice computer screens and um, the tutor or the lecturer who's teaching us that day can kind of video themselves doing the, um, drilling the tooth and showing us how they would do it in real time with a kind of recording going on. And we can see it right in front of us on the screen in our station, which is, is really nice. So third year, third year is a great year. It's um, much less academic based and you're moving more uh, clinical. Um, so we get sent to different uh, places in London. Um, one of them being the Ludwig Gutman Center in Stratford, East London, and also Barkentine Practice, which is in Canary Wharf. And also we're based in Whitechapel, which is um, really where you'll spend most of your time. Um, the great thing about um, going to these places is that you're really seeing high need patients. So these patients may not uh, be able to afford dental treatment. So it's a kind of win-win situation. We get the experience and they get the free dental treatment that they, they really need. Um, and because they're high needs patients, they need a lot done. So it's, it's, it's definitely a good situation for us as learning students. Another portion that's intro introduced into third year at BART's is uh, a different part of dentistry, which is prosthetics. So that's things like dentures, uh, crowns and bridges. And at BART's, we have an in-house prosthetics lab. I'll show you here. This is um, <clears throat> a denture that everyone has to make in third year. So um, we spend a bit of time kind of getting used to setting the teeth. And this is just wax. And there's lots of different processes which uh, get into uh, making dentures, uh, but um, it, it's quite complex and it's a great learning experience in third year. So in terms of my experience in third year, I was very, very lucky to win a pair of loops. Um, so loops are essentially magnifying glasses, you can see here, um, that can help um, your clinical work. So doing like drilling and filling essentially. And uh, the reason I was, um, I say I'm so lucky is because this equipment is quite expensive, but more and more um, general practitioners and dentists in general are getting loops because they can really, really improve your clinical work and kind of up your standard. Um, so I was very lucky there and I'm very thankful for that. Um, the reason I've included this image here, this is kind of just a stock photo of a, a dental microscope. And this is kind of the next level of magnification um, in dentistry and they can kind of help your posture but really they're there for doing very um, detailed dental work like root canal treatment that really needs high magnification and uh, at BART's we have uh, five or six microscopes that they let um, us students use which is really really good. Uh, now moving on to fourth year so fourth year is a very very busy year um, there's lots of clinics, um, but not too much academic wise again. So we're gradually kind of phasing out um, lectures and just ramping up the amount of clinical experience we get, which is, which is really good. Um, in the fourth year, we get sent to Southend uh, in Essex. And thankfully the travel is paid for by the uni. Um, and at Southend, again, we see very, very high need patients and uh, this is a photo of uh, my clinical group and another clinical group along with our tutors. Um, and we honestly had a very, very good time there. We were very lucky to see a lot of patients. We would see, we would tend to see around uh, three to four patients a day, which doesn't really sound like a lot um, for a normal dentist, but for a student, it's actually quite a lot. And it, um, 
it really in fourth year you really gain a lot of clinical experience another major um, portion of fourth year is the dental elective and what that is essentially you can go to um, either a different country or you can go to a different hospital in the UK to see how uh, dentistry is run so me and a few of my colleagues so Raj, Kieran and Krish we all went to South America so we went to Peru to a dental school to see how their infection control was and um, so you you essentially do a project um, over there and you you kind of do a poster presentation when you come back um, but it's a really really great experience definitely very eye-opening and we also this is this photo here um, is us in Argentina um, in front of a glacier uh, because we kind of make a holiday out of it so we went to Argentina Brazil and Chile as well which was really really fun so finally fifth year which um, should be your final year and it's the year that I'm currently in um, so this year is pretty much purely clinical maybe only one or two lectures a week and um, again we have extra clinics where we can observe um, consultants like dental consultants who are the best of the best and we can see how they how they practice and how they kind of treat their patients um, and there's definitely a lot to learn from these extra clinics um, also we what i mean by finishing off our finals cases is that um, at the end of fifth year we have a kind of spoken exam where um, we will have treated a patient or a couple of patients and we'll have created a poster or presentation um, of how we treated them uh, with the, the treatment plan, their medical history, and we would have to describe to the examiners how we treated that patient, so what we did from start to finish, um, why we did that, uh, what went well, and what could be improved. And um, this is a photo uh, that I took of uh, my patient's dentures. So these dentures uh, I actually made in the lab, um, but unfortunately due to the corona, um, situation I wasn't able to finish fitting them so hopefully someone in the year below or the year below that can um, fit them for me and hopefully they fit very well so that that's the course itself academic wise but there's lots of things that go uh, go on outside of the course um, in uh, Queen Mary and Barcelona London there's lots of volunteering opportunities if you want to get into that um, another big event is a dental dinner which uh, occurs once a year and uh, on you can see on this photo here this is a, me and my friends um, we kind of go to a very kind of swanky uh, um, venue uh, have a nice dinner and it's kind of like a ball, a ball and it's very very nice um, tables is a um, student run uh, sports kind of meetup it happens every wednesday in the student union um, we have a, a dental christmas party purely for the dentists um, Barts versus Kings is another dental event where we meet up with the Kings dental students uh, kind of on a party night out, which is nice. Uh, these two events, BDSA, um, Sports Day and Conference, these are really, really good events. Um, this is the British Dental Students Association, and we essentially meet up twice a year. It's all the dental schools in the country, and we all meet up um, uh, for one sports day and one conference a year, which is it's really great to um, meet um, other students from different dental schools and kind of talk about your experiences. It's really nice. Uh, also, midway ball, which is um, when, you've, when you're halfway through the course in third year, and graduation ball when you've finished. So lots of events. So what's next? So you finish dental school, you've done the five years or six years if you intercalate. Um, and after that, most people go on to do something called foundation training. I'm sure Dr. Berry will talk more in depth about what this involves and dental core training as well. So I won't dwell too much on this. Okay, that's pretty much it. Thank you. I wish everyone good luck. And if you have any questions, feel free to put it on the chat. Um, or you can email me uh, at this email address. or And this is my Instagram handle. Great, thank you so much, Murray, for that really inspiring and insightful talk. 
Um, so we're going to hand over to Mabin and he's going to take any questions that you guys might have. So using the Mentimeter platform, if you guys can put in the code and ask any questions you might have and Mario will answer them as best as he possibly can. Yeah. Um, so I just ask you to answer, answer these questions quickly. So yes, you'll be able to view the live stream after it finishes. Um, I will answer this question later in a different talk um, with the UCAT. Um, so if anyone has any questions specific uh, to uh, Murray's talk, please do uh, post them up and uh, I'll give you a few minutes. So Murray, the first question is, what is the teaching style at Barts for dentistry? Okay, so um, in the first two years, it's, it's mainly lectures based. And then as we go on three, four and five, we get a bit more seminar based teaching and um, uh, less, less and less lectures. It's, it's, we kind of, uh, we have our clinical groups, which uh, there's around eight to 10 people. And we spend a lot of time in those clinical groups and have seminars, uh, kind of very small group teaching, which is nice. Nice. Uh, what made you choose Bart's over King's? Uh, it was really the size of the dental school. Um, King's have, I think, up maybe 160, 170 students. Um, so I felt it would be nicer to um, go to a more kind of close-knit um, dental school where everyone's very friendly and um, you know everyone. Okay. Um, you don't have to answer this <laughs> <Yeah>. one. <laughs> as, long as, get, as long as you meet the requirements, it's fine. Should we let um, Dr. Yeah. Berry answer that? Why choose dentistry over medicine? That's a good question. Um, probably the work-life balance and the practical side. So I felt with dentistry, it's kind of a classic answer, but you're definitely using your hands a lot more. That, that was really the main attraction for me. Uh, so as soon as you um, you passed your exams uh, in fifth year, you will get the title. So um, how does that? Yep. Uh, with regard to workload, um, I'm sure if if you put the work in to get those A level grades, it's I, I felt that A levels was actually harder to be honest. For electives, um, you can get funding from the university, but most of it you will have to fund for yourself. There are kind of um, bursaries that they give, I think it's up to 500 pounds. Um, so I applied for one actually in fourth year and I got, I think a 400 pound bursary, which obviously helps, but it won't cover the whole cost if you're planning to go abroad. So once you uh, do your five years at university, and if you want to go into work in the NHS, then um, you do an extra foundation year. But I'm sure Dr. Berry will touch on that. Um, for this one, I think it was mainly I, I did uh, work experience at my dental practice, my local dental practice, and my dentist was a really, really nice guy, a really inspiring guy, actually, and he was the one that kind of made me think about going into dentistry. Uh, so I applied to uh, Kings, Barts, Manchester, and Birmingham. Uh, we've answered that one. Um, well, we've got a very good support system at the university. Um, Dr. Berry is, uh, or used to be head of student support, and we've got a very good team to help anyone with any questions. The staff are very friendly. So if you have any questions, they're really approachable.
Да. I mean, it's a tough process, um, but um, I definitely recommend um, preparing for interviews um, and preparing for UK CAT and just work as hard as you can for your A-levels to get the grades. That's all you can do, really. Yes, so there are written exams um, and they occur every year. And there are also practical exams and spoken exams. So throughout dentistry, there are quite a few examinations that you will have to uh, carry out. Um, I'll just answer that. Um, yeah, so this talk is uh, mainly for medical and dental applicants. Um, uh, if Or if you do have um, a bit of an idea, uh, if you do want to apply for medicine and dentistry, uh, this is this is a talk for you. But um, some of the topics we cover are also relatable to other uh, university degrees as well. For example, a um, interviews and uh, personal statement advice, but it's specifically tailored for medicine and dentistry. Uh, we've answered this. Yeah. Yep. Workload? Um, I've kind of covered that. Yeah. Uh, we covered that. Um, just yeah, so in my year, I think there's 68 people. So quite a small, particularly com in comparison to medicine, where I think, uh, I don't know how many there are in your year, Naveen, but I think there's... Yeah, uh, there's around 300, yeah. Um, yeah. Let's have a look. Um, nope. Uh, what's the most difficult part of the dentistry course? Um, we'll end on that question. Yeah, uh, I think that's a great question to end on. Um, as I said before, if you've got into dentistry, you can definitely get through dentistry. So don't worry about that. I think the hardest part is really um, managing your time. Um, getting that kind of work-life balance between, um, especially if you're living out, kind of cooking, doing laundry um, and studying and also having a social life and sleep is very, very difficult at first. So I think that was the biggest leap that I had to take. Okay, thank you very much, Murray. Um, what I will do is um, I'll just reset the questions. Just bear with me. Um, and we'll come back to that later on. But um, thank you very much, uh, Murray, for your talk. Um, okay. And uh, we will move on to Dr. Berry. Um, just bear with us. Yep, Dr. Berry will now be giving a talk on an insight into dentistry. Hi, Dr. Berry. Um, do you yeah. have your slides up? Yes, I do. Yes. Can you not see them? Uh, no. Um, okay, hold on. Any better? No, we still uh, can't no. see the um, What we'll do is we'll get your talk up, and if that's fine, and then uh, if you just um, say a next slide so we can um, navigate through that. No problem. Just bear with us one moment. Okay. Whenever you're ready. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Next slide, please. Good evening, everyone. Next slide. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you, Murray. Go back. Go back. Go back. You're skipping ahead. Go back. 
Uh, thank you, Murray. Um, I had the fortunate thing of uh, teaching Murray for the last five years, and I can't believe where those five years have actually gone. He's actually survived the undergraduate BDS degree course. Congratulations, Murray, or Dr. Murray. Um, anyway, he has survived along with his other cohort members. Um, five full on years, uh, numerous lectures, seminars, they've treated um, a number of patients. They've also partied hard, as you saw. Um, and now they're just going to embark into their foundation year. This is a, a year post qualification where the students or dentists, newly qualified dentists, they go into practice in specific uh, chosen uh, practices where they actually sort of gain more experience in treating patients. The dentist in the practice acts as their mentor and they actually build up their experience and also their speed as well, treating patients. So the one year foundation training program is a good sort of intermediary between qualification and also taking those lone steps into the world of uh, dentistry. Right. So what's next then after the foundation year? Well, the majority of our dental graduates will go into uh, general dental practice, 85% of them. Um, and this will be either within the NHS or private or mixed practices. Usually they start off in the NHS and gain their experience. And then later on in their career, they'd move into general uh, private practice. 15%, however, will take an alternative career route. Now, this may be working in hospitals, might go into academia, i.e. teaching, for example, might go into the forces, the armed forces, might take a research career, or might go into the uh, uh, community health um, arena as well. So there's quite a few different ways of progressing after your dental course, and that's what I'm going to sort of talk about now. Next slide. So general practice then, let's uh, kick off with that, because as I say, about 85% of our students will go into general dental practice. So all of these skills you will need, and these are skills that will make you a good dentist or doctor, uh, you need to be a good team player because you're going to be part of a team. You need to be able to talk confidently to members of the public, all different types of people. You'll also have to develop management and business skills as well, because at the end of the day, general dental practice is also a business. You've got to be very self-motivated as well. Next slide. So as I say, team working is really important. Because you could be a member of a small team, or you could be a member of a very large team within the practice. So you have to like people, you have to get on with people. Next slide. The beauty of general dental practice is that every day is different. It is not a routine, mundane job because, in effect, you don't know really what is going to walk in the door. Next slide. For example, on a Monday morning, you could be presented by this. Okay, someone might have been in the fight; they might have fallen over and they smashed their front tooth. So you have got to have all the things at your disposal: your knowledge, your dexterity, the materials to actually fix this patient or at least plan to fix this patient. Next slide. You know, also the routine things, you know, doing fillings, diagnosing people who are in pain, getting them out of pain as well. So the routine things of fillings, extractions as well. You sometimes just do not know what's going to walk in the door. And in part, that's quite exciting. Next slide. You might be, for example, um, placing implants. This is uh, someone who's, uh, who's having an implant plate. An implant is a false tooth that we'll screw into. Right. So next slide. You know, and again, this is the same patient undergoing the implant placement. You've got to be prepared to see blood. You've got to be prepared to deal with blood as well, because as a dentist, unfortunately, or fortunately, you will be dealing with blood. Next slide. You might also have patients such as this young lady, okay. a nice young lady who has got very nice teeth. However, it might not be as it seems. Next slide. Because this particular patient was actually wearing a denture which had been made for her. 
as an interim measure. Unfortunately, as a due to a road traffic accident, had lost a majority of her teeth in her upper jaw. So, you know, you've got to be prepared to do all sorts of things. Next slide. Where will you work? Now, there's some very, very swanky dental practices out there. Look at this one, lovely building. Next slide. You know, the buildings, uh, the practices of today are high tech. Um, you know, they're trying to attract patients. So, you know, generally now the practices are lovely places, spacious, airy, air conditioned, nice places to work. Next slide. You might also be fortunate to work in a practice where they might have a laboratory on site. So all those dentures and crowns that are being made, you don't send them off to an external lab. You might send them to an internal lab as well. But you can have real major input into the design of these false procedures. Slide. You might also work in an NHS practice. Some of these practices are, are quite plain, but they offer a very important service, sometimes to sort of quite a, a rundown community as well. They all play their part in maintaining the health and the dental health of our Next slide. A few years ago, the British Dental Journal uh, hosted a competition where dentists could send in photographs Use from their dental practices, and there's some of these are the pictures which submitted. So you know you could you could work in some very very nice places. So there's a lot of good things about general practice. You're your own boss. If you like technology, there's lots of gadgets out there that you can learn how to use. You can you've got massive travel opportunities because you don't necessarily have to work just in this country. You could work up in Scotland. You could go abroad and work as well. Okay, next slide. However, general practice also has its downsides, as all jobs do, and it's very, very important that you sort of take note of these things. Like a lot of jobs nowadays, there's government targets, there's lots of paperwork to be done. You've got to overcome that public perception that patient sits in your chair, and the first thing they might say is, oh, I hate the dentist. Also, there's the negatives of getting bad back and bad posture. You know, so you've got to look after yourself as well. And, you know, putting cards on the table, dentistry is quite as stressful, but it's also a very rewarding profession. Next slide. One of the beauties of dentistry, though, is its flexibility. I had my own practice. I was in practice for 25 years. And then I had a bit of an epiphany, and I thought I'd like to change the direction of my career. And that is why I'm now a tutor, full-time tutor, and at the um, Barts and the London School of Medicine and Dentistry. So there are lots of other opportunities that you can do within dentistry. Okay, next slide. So let's have a look at alternatives to general dental, pra dental practice then. Next slide. So the armed forces. Now, yes, dentists are needed in the armed forces, the Army, the Navy and the RAF. You go in at officer level, you're well looked after, you're well paid, and also you have top of notch equipment as well. So armed forces is, is uh, something to think about. And if you think about going in the armed forces at an early stage, then sometimes they actually pay you to go through the dental course, commit to them for five years afterwards. Um, next slide. Also within dentistry, there are specialist pathways. So you might spend a couple of years in general dental practice, and then you might decide you want to get more knowledge in a certain area of dentistry. So then you can go back to studying, if you wish, part-time or full-time, and become a specialist in a particular area. For example, you might want to become a specialist in braces or orthodontics, children's dentistry, pediatric dentistry, or you could become an oral pathologist. You might want to join a special care unit. Okay. Or you might want to specialise in other areas or what we call the restorative specialities. Right. So here we are, orthodontics. Most of you probably will have had braces, so you know what orthodontics are. Also, you know and are probably aware of the teamwork between the dentist and the nurse as they provided your care. Next slide. 
oral surgery. Oral surgery is not only about taking out wisdom teeth or taking out difficulty teeth. It is also repairing people as well, possibly after road traffic accidents, as in this case here, where the patient came in with a broken lower jaw and had to be Next slide. So again, with the oral surgeons within uh, the hospital environment, quite often the oral surgeons are dual qualified. In, in other words, they do dentistry as their first qualification, then they go off and do medicine as the second qualification, and then they do the specialist exams for oral surgery as well. So it's quite a prolonged, but also a very rewarding career pathway. Next slide. So as you can see here, this is an oral surgery and an orthodontics case. Patient with a cleft which is going to be repaired, but before it is repaired, the orthodontist will be realigning these teeth. So you've got two specialists working side by side for the care of the teeth. Next slide. I mentioned about the restorative specialities. You might want to become a gum specialist or periodontist, a crown bridge uh, specialist or a restorative dentist. You might want to specialise in the implants, or you might want to specialise in root canal treatment, which is called an endodontist. You might be in general practice and you actually like doing cosmetic dentistry. You like repairing patients' smiles. Nowadays, people like to have their teeth whitened. They like to have their teeth whitened. Yes, you do see also some horrendous things going on as well. But, you know, we try and train you to be very, very ethical and do the right thing. Next slide. For example, you might get a patient who comes in here looking like this. So before picture, look at the before picture. Look at the two front teeth. Now, everything looks relatively okay, but the two front teeth, look a little bit grayer than the adjacent teeth. The reason for this is that the teeth either side of the two front teeth are actually false teeth, and they are stuck onto the front teeth with little metal wings, what we call wings, and those metal wings are glued on the backs of the front teeth. The problem is the metal work is shining through the tooth, and that's what's giving them a gray tinge. Patient doesn't like that. I can understand why. So very, very difficult. But you take the bridges off. And you make a different type of bridge, maybe out of ceramic, and stick those on again. And you can see the after photograph, which is after fitting of the new bridges, where you have not got that greyish tinge. Just by doing something like that, the patient will be eternally grateful to you. For. Next slide. Then you've got the very, very complex cases where a patient might come to you and they have got a multitude of problems, gum problems, lack of bone, the teeth are falling apart, they need extensive restoration, which needs to be really well planned out. A lot of time is spent in the planning before the execution of treatment. Special care dentistry definitely warrants a mention here because this is a speciality a growing speciality where dentists specialise in treating people who have special needs who might not be able to go to a general dental practice. It accounts for kids, it accounts for adults as well. You need a lot of time spending on them and the special care dentist provides the service. Next slide. If you love kids, become a paediatric dentist. It's, they have their own, their own set of issues, their own set of problems and everything. And it takes a special dentist to become a paediatric dentist. The specialist will sort of do some quite sort of um, difficult treatments on them as well. Next slide. Oral pathology, I mentioned that earlier, but you know, just unfortunately cancers and cysts and things like that, they actually happen in the mouth, around the mouth. You know, they need to be resected or taken out by the oral surgeons. They need to be checked by the oral pathologist to see what they are as part of a learning process and also as part of how can we best treat these patients in the future. Next slide. 
So unfortunately, this patient had to have the entire top jaw removed by a neural surgeon. And also it was repaired with a special type of denture as well. But again, many specialities supporting this patient now to try and improve the quality of life of its own. Right. So if you fancy looking down slides, uh, looking down the microscope, diagnosing cancers and other sort of uh, diseases, and perhaps oral pathology is the way to go for you. Next slide. Research. There are dentists who do a lot of research. You know, think about all those toothpaste that are on the shelves. It's usually dentists who's researched those. Look at all the materials that are used. It's usually dentists who design those and, and, and invent these materials. Okay? So there's a hell of a lot of research going on behind the scenes as well. So if you've got that very inquiring mind, maybe research is the way to go for you. Next slide. And at uh, Queen Mary, we have a fantastic uh, facilities called the Blizzard Building, where top, uh, you know, real top arch research is going on currently. Next slide. And there's the internal aspect of that building as well. Next slide. If you commit to, to being a dentist, this also applies to medicine as well. You have got to be prepared for lifelong learning. You just don't do your five years like Murray has completed and then forget about it. You have got to continually update your skills, learn new things, dentistry and also medicine by changing at an amazing rate. You've got to keep up to date so that you can offer your patients the most up to date and safest and ethical treatment as possible. Next slide. So are you up to it? That's what you've got to think about. Next slide. So thank you very much. Hopefully that's given you a little bit of a vision of what dentistry is about. And re reiterating what Murray said, um, a choice between dentistry and medicine, both of them are fantastic careers. Dentistry is probably that little bit more dexterous. You're using your hands, you're getting in there. Um, and also to a certain degree, you're also getting to know your patients a lot better as well, because when you're in general practice, usually those patients come and see you you know, in my practice, I saw parents, I saw their children, and I saw those children grow up, and they became parents themselves. So you develop quite a good bond. Anyway, hopefully that's given you a nice insight into what the dentist actually does. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Dr. Berry, for that talk. Really motivational for our students. Again, we're just now going to move on to the questions. So feel free to use the Mentimeter platform and ask any questions you might have to Dr. Berry, and he'll be answering them for you. I wasn't aware of that fact. <laughs> How do you get recruited for research? Well. Become a dentist, and then uh, as part of the five-year BDS course, we get you to do little research projects, and you know it sort of might ignite a little spark there, and then you might go down the research field. Um, uh, let's, let's move on. Yeah. Student Lectures Murray is probably the best one to, to answer this one, but um, at the moment we're doing a lot of our teaching or, or lectures online because of COVID, but when we actually come back into some form of normality, we're going to do blended teaching, so that's going to be a mixture of online teaching, face-to-face -face lectures and also small group seminars as well. Um, a-level biology does help, okay? However, if you haven't got A-level biology, you've got chemistry instead, that's fine. Um, you just might just have to work a little, little bit hard in that first year to sort of get your knowledge of biology up to scratch. Again, you go through the normal five years of doing your dental degree. You might then do your foundation year which is another one more year. 
And then you go into general practice and then you might have that spark moment and say, right, I think I'd like to specialise in paediatrics. Now that possibly would mean another three years of actual specialising within a hospital environment. I think you covered yeah. What's the hardest part of dentistry? Oh, now that is a question. That is the hardest part of dentistry, I think, is keeping everyone happy, whether that's your staff, whether that's your patients, and also, very importantly, yourself as well. Because it's a very stressful job, but also is a very rewarding job as well on many fronts. Work experience, yes, we're all very aware about work experience or lack of work experience for yourselves. Um, and what we're telling our students is we're not going to hold that against you if you can't get work experience. What we would say, though, to you is that, you know, during the COVID situation, what are you actually, are you doing anything for your community? Are you helping the a person down the road who can't get their shopping? Think a little bit more laterally as well, because in medicine and dentistry, we want people person. We don't want you to be shut away in your bedrooms 24-7. We want people who are willing to get out there and engage with the general public. Oh. General dentists can do implants. Um, however, you, you know, you can't just pick up an implant drill and just drill away. You have to go into a number of courses as well. Um, this is what I did personally. I went on to a number of courses, spent a lot of money doing those courses, and then I did simple implants, and then as my experience uh, increased, then I did more complex implants. And nowadays you can also specialise as well. No, the job isn't repetitive because even though you might be doing, you know, sort of, 10 checkups in a, in a morning session, each individual patient is different, their needs will be different, and their wants will be different as well. So the job is not repetitive. And if it does become repetitive, then you've got to find a way of not making it repetitive. And that might be the time where you think of doing something different with the intended stroke. <laughs> Again, do your five years, get that experience behind you, and then you go off and then you can become a specialist in orthodontics. But it's a long process nowadays. You need an extra three years, uh, maybe it's one of the postgraduate dental schools. And we'll end on this question. How competitive okay. is um, dentistry? Okay, well, I'm quite well positioned to answer that question because I'm the senior admissions student in dentistry as well. So we have about 600 applications per year to do dentistry, and that is for about 70, 71 places. So that's how competitive it is. Okay. Great. Thank you, Dr. Berry, for answering those questions for us. So Thank you. now we'll be moving on to our next talk, and it's going to be the first of our talks on medicine. And it's going to be delivered by Dr. Leslie Robson on an introduction to medicine. Hello, everybody. Hope you can all hear me. And looks like yeah. the screen is working. Um, I apologise if it's a bit small. Um, I'm happy for anybody if they want it to be emailed or to uh, be sent out to them. There's nothing confidential in any of this, and it's all freely available. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about... Um, the medical course and um, a little bit about the medical career and that's the idea of what I'm going to be talking about um, so if just go, go right um, so um, what we hopefully that's changed and what we want is our doctors to actually reflect the population that they serve and so as, as this um, slide shows I mean it's who is the doctor in this uh, picture in this image who's the nurse who's the physician's associate who's the physiotherapist who's the occupational therapist 
And um, like uh, Dr. Berry was saying, uh, doctors don't work in isolation. They work as part of a team. And this team um, is working together for the benefit of the patient so that the patient gets the best care and um, is able to uh, feel better and to lead a healthy lifestyle. Um, but medicine, if you're thinking of going into medicine, um, it's, it's not a, an easy course and it is uh, not a quick course to go through. Um, what you need to do is um, to think about what it is you're doing. So in uh, the medical school and the course itself, when you get into medical school, is um, on average five years that you will be in the medical school. Um, if you do an intercalated year, that takes it to five or possibly six years. Um, the four-year course, that is for people who've already got a previous degree and for the graduate entry. So it's a, it's a very select group. So you're, you're in there for a, a sort of, if you're coming straight from school for five years, six years if you want to do an extra year of an intercalated degree on top of that. At the end of it, certainly if you come to Barton, London, you graduate with a MBBS, uh, that's a, mass, a Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery, and that means you're able to practice medicine but um, on your own, but you then go into two years of foundation training, and that's F1 and F2, and that's this block of uh, teaching here. This is when you're in hospitals um, and you go round different specialities, um, testing out the water as to which area of medicine you think you want to go into. So you'll do a bit of surgery, a bit of GP, a bit of uh, medicine um, and general work. And that's going to, um, so that you can move um, through to your next stage, which is out here, which is um, your ST um, or surgical training or specialist training um, and GP training, if that's what you want to go into, or into core training and then into the specialist training um, further on. Even after this, and as you can see, that's up to maybe up to eight years. Um, GP is a little bit quicker. Um, and then you can go on through the hierarchy and going into your consultant years. So there is still actually a lot of um, education that you will be required to go through um, even after you've graduated and have earned the title of doctor is that even though you're able to um, treat patients out here, um, you're still going undergoing um, monitoring and further training and as Dr. Berry has also mentioned it's about lifelong learning so if we go into what would happen if when you get into the medical school so that's your first sort of five six years um, we have a spiral curriculum here at Barts in the London and that means um, you start off in the early years of the course in years one and two which I have my main responsibility for um, where we try and give you the scientific basis for medicine. So trying to give you the uh, clinical science that underpins um, the function of the human body and then what can happen when things go wrong with the normal working of the human body, um, what happens um, and what is the disease process. And then starting to think in year two of... Um, what also treatments you might um, give these, these patients who have a particular um, disease or a different um, bodily function. And then you go into years uh, three and four, which are uh, much more clinical. In years one and two, it's a mixture of classroom-based, small group teaching, um, as well as early clinical contact, mainly in GP or community-based um, settings is the clinical context. Um, years three and four, you're out in the hospitals uh, and GP placements for much longer blocks and the smaller classroom 
um, weeks in that years three and four. Year four is um, a little bit heavy and we've, we're undergoing a curriculum review to try and even out the uh, content between years three and four to make it a bit of a, a smoother journey through. Uh, year four at the moment is very specialist heavy. You, you're undergoing uh, psychiatry, neurosurgery, neurology, paediatrics, obs and gynae. Uh, it, it's, it's a bit heavy. Rheumatology is in there. Year five is preparation for practice. Um, you get to shadow um, a doctor, an F1 doctor who's in your placement when you apply for the foundation trust. Um, you take your finals. Um, and if you apply, you'll be taking the uh, general UK MLA exam, which is a, a general exit exam. Um, that's been devised um, and will be implemented by the GMC. Alongside all this, as we've, uh, you've heard, it's about team learning, working as part of a team, as well as hand, hands-on practicals. Early clinical experience is what we're aiming to give you with a transition to less classroom-based and more uh, clinical teaching in years three, four and five getting you ready to be a doctor at this point, at the point of graduation, you will be um, a doctor, you will be treating patients more or less on your own, but with supervision um, in the early stages. As Dr. Berry has mentioned, uh, and it's the same for medicine, is that it's about lifelong learning. And even um, in the early days of the uh, medical profession, life is uh, so short, the craft so long to learn. You are constantly learning new things every day of your academic and um, professional life. And this is important. And we, we aim to also um, help you develop your study skills and develop your study style. What works for you at A level may not work and transition to university where you become an independent learner. And we aim to try and give you uh, study skills and mentoring to help you develop your own uh, learning style so that you can progress through your career with the necessary skills. So um, it's, a, it's about learning to also embrace failure. Um, we can only learn if we fail um, and we aim to try and help you to understand that just because you might fail an exam, it's not the end of the world and that you can succeed and there are opportunities for you. It's about learning from those mistakes and what went wrong, why did it go wrong? How can I uh, make certain that that doesn't happen in the future? So it's about learning your own learning style. Well, I think we have to appreciate is that medicine is changing it's not the same uh, now as it was a couple of months ago. And, and I think this is important in that also the medical school is changing. You've heard from Dr. Berry about um, even how the coronavirus, um, COVID-19 pandemic has changed the way we are uh, delivering the course now. And some of those changes will continue because um, that's the way medicine Medicine is um, developing into less of this, this face-to-face -face meetings. GPs and hospital consultants, uh, this is from Newham, um, one of our um, hospital trusts, that have embraced video conferencing and video uh, consultations for uh, treating patients. And I think this is going to stay for the future. Um, a lot of uh, GP, uh, GPs and also hospital consultants have been working during the pandemic virtually and remotely from their homes, as we are tonight, um, and using their computers to um, share x-rays, test data, as well as also talking to their patient. And what we're also learning is that this requires new skills and that need to be uh, developed and uh, nurtured um, that you might not have. 
So all down to this little structure here, this is the um, coronavirus that we've all been um, busily um, learning lots about in the last couple of months. And also what we're learning from this virus is how it affects different populations differently, how it affects the, the Bain community more um, severely than the Caucasian community. And this has also led into person, what was developing already but is accelerated is personalised genomic medicine. And this means that each individual patient, their genetic code may determine which diseases they are uh, more susceptible to and also which treatments are going to be better for them. So rather than just a blanket, oh, this is this disease and this is the standard treatment, we are having to think about how the individual's own um, genetic code is influencing him. So medicine is changing, it's at a crossroads at the moment and the old challenges are being replaced by new challenges that um, is an exciting time but also a little bit scary. You've heard that dentistry has lots of uh, potential career paths and this slide was um, developed from the BMJ in 2005, but it's still relevant. And it's a kind of algorithm, it's a kind of jokey algorithm, a light-hearted way of trying to make your choice um, through the various career paths that you have um, the possibility to go into. And as you've heard with dentistry, medicine is varied, um, not only um, in the career paths, but you can go into general surgery, into rehab medicine, to neurology, pathology, if you like, looking down microscopes and looking at biopsies, um, anesthesia, if you like putting people to sleep, um, ops and gynae, if you like um, helping uh, pregnant women and helping to deliver uh, babies, um, but also the family practice, the GP is an important role um, and so we have a variety of different career options and you can always switch between them. That's what the foundation years are there for, to help you experience in a bit more depth which speciality you want to go into. And you can switch paths. Hi everyone, um, sorry about that. Um, we're just having some technical difficulties. Um, we should have um, everything sorted in about five to 10 minutes. So please do bear with us. Thank you very much. Hi, Dr. Robson. Sorry about that. Yeah. Sorry. Is everything okay? Yeah, um, I'm using my phone. And my my computer's sorry. My apologies. My computer's really old. And no worries. That's fine. Whether it got really hot. Um, that, that's so fine. I was I've at got, the end of the. 
I was at the end of the talk, luckily. No so worries. you haven't missed anything on the talk, guys. Um, what I will do is um, I've shared the screen. So um, it, it, it cut off at varied career choices. Um, you yeah. were talking about Ops and Gynae. Um, so um, if you want to finish your talk. Yeah, that, thank you. Um, sorry about that. Um, so, um, yeah. Ops and Gynae, it was really just that there is so much variety that you have open to you um, that, um, and you can mm -hmm. switch even when you're in the foundation um, part of the course, you can switch, you, that it's not final um, and to, even in that core training, you can switch themes, you can switch areas that you want to specialize in. So it's not fixed until you actually come out of that core training. It might take you a bit longer, but you can always switch. So if we have the final slide. Just there. Okay. Um, so really, um, but whatever your speciality, um, and I think this is a message, is, it is that um, anybody can become a physician. Anybody can become a doctor. You just need the right A-level grades. But to be a really great physician, you need to have some empathy, some people skills that make you stand out and make you um, or make your patients feel comfortable that uh, you've got their best interests at heart. So I think that's the main uh, uh, take our message is and from the first slide, it's, it's only if you can't think of anything else that you want to do, then um, medicine's for you. You might have the A-level grades, you might have mm -hmm. the aptitude, but really what you need is um, a kind of people skills to be able to put the patient at, um, at ease with themselves. So I'll leave it at that point and take any questions that you have. Great, thanks, Dr. Robson. That was a really informative and insightful talk. Um, so, yeah, moving on to questions again, and if anyone has any questions for Dr. Robson about medicine, then please do feel free to ask, and Dr. Robson will answer them as best as she possibly can. Yeah, um, just before we start on questions, um, I would just like to apologise uh, for any inappropriate questions. Please do avoid any inappropriate um uh, questions and they will not be answered and I apologize on behalf of um, the SAMDA team of uh, any um, inappropriate qu uh, questions but with that we will start with um, the Q&A for Dr. Robson just bear with me um. Why? okay um. It's a difficult question because um, because all the medical schools, it doesn't matter where you go to, all the courses are regulated by the GMC. So the courses um, are pretty much the same. Sometimes it's, it's about the delivery and what um, suits you. So we have in years one and two a um, mixed format, a hybrid. It's a mixture of lectures, about nine hours of lectures a week. Um, PBL, about two to four hours a week of uh, problem-based learning. Very small group, eight to nine of you with a facilitator. Um, small group teaching for anatomy, physiology, histology, clinical skills, communication skills, and that early patient contact. Um, some medical schools don't have as much clinical contact. Some people, some medical schools have more lectures, some medical schools have more small group teaching, these PBLs. Um, I would say I, you pick a course that suits your learning style. Um, I wouldn't say BARTS is any better, although I love BARTS, um, is any better, uh, and it doesn't suit everybody. Um, so I think you need to think and look at the prospectus and think about how the course is delivered and what you think you'd be comfortable with. Um, why choose BARTS though? It's the family atmosphere, it's, it's like Sander, um, it's the student body. The students make the university and make the medical school. It, they're very supportive of the, um, the older years, they're very supportive of the younger years. 
Um, there's a very tight community. The staff student relationship is very good. We listen to what the students um, tell us. We uh, respond to their feedback and we try and um, make certain that the course is um, reflective of what the students need and that they feel supported. So I would say, why choose BARTS? I would say because of the, of the students, the, the rest of the student body. Um, what am I looking for or what does the university look for? Um, so um, what am I looking for? I'm looking for somebody who's enthusiastic, somebody who um, really wants to do medicine and can think of nothing else. Um, that they would rather do, um, so a bit of commitment, a um, bit of um, motivation. You need to be self-motivated, not only in medical school, but beyond medical school into your career. You need to have a bit of tenacity. Um, you need to be a team player. Communication skills and the, the um, hands-on clinical skills, we can um, help develop those, but a little bit of just being interested in people. Um, so when you come to interview, just showing a bit of interest um, and that you've got a bit of enthusiasm and also a bit of life outside of the um, study. So you've got outside activities, that's really important. So have you got a work-life balance sorted? That's what we're looking for. Um. Um, Should we move on? Yeah, why not? I mean, I think these days with the COVID, I think we've, we've kind of come to value the NHS and what it stands for, and that it's free at the point of delivery. Um, I'm not certain the private sector could deliver the same um, amount or quantity to everybody. Uh, so what rotations are part of the third year course? Um, so you have, at the moment, um, again, we're going through this curriculum view, so it may change slightly. It's uh, cardiorespiratory, so uh, cardiothoracic surgery or um, a respiratory physician's award. Um, and then we have metabolism, which I think Professor Kumar um, will tell you more about, um, where you're looking at Gas, uh, gastroenterology, um, but also general surgery um, is in there. And there's also GP. So we'll have um, GP in there in year three. How do you find the um, A work-life balance. Work-life balance. We, um, so in years one and two, we would say you probably need to um, so outside of the timetabled sessions, uh, you'd probably want to do about an hour to an hour and a half outside research of that. Where you do it is up to you. Um, the whole of Wednesday afternoon is uh, free for societies. Um, and there are, as you've heard from um, Murray, there's lots of uh, societies that you can get involved with that have social activities. Um, and go out, have meals together, have, have sport. Um, there's lots of things you can get involved with. And that Friday, um, Wednesday afternoon is completely free. And then um, the activities such as that. So you can, you can fit actually quite a lot around the study. Um, um, what do you recommend students during lockdown? Uh -huh. We've been saying that um, as long as you sort of keep up with your um, notes, um, a bit of um, roundabout reading is always good. What aspect of medicine do you like the most? We'll wrap up with this question. Okay, good one. Um, variety. I think you never know what's going to walk in through the door. Um, even with you specialise in every patient that you see is an individual. They have um, their own unique take um, on their illness um, and also how their illness presents. Um, and you need to work with that. So it, even when you think you know everything, you don't. 
because your patients will be your lifelong um, teachers. Okay. Great. Thanks so much, Dr. Robson, for answering Thank those you. questions and for again, us. And again, apologies for my very old computer, which overheated mm. in the hot weather. No worries. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you very much. Okay, great. So now we'll be moving on to our next talk. Again, it's on medicine and it will be delivered by Mohsin and he'll be talking to us about life as a medical student. Hello, hi, good evening everyone. Uh, and thank you to uh, the Samda committee for inviting me. Uh, so I'm a bit embarrassed because my I don't have as many slides as the other uh, speakers. So I might have to go slightly off script uh, but anyway, um, so my name is Mossin, and um, I'll be talking about life as a medical student here at Barts in the London. Uh, next slide, please. So just briefly, who am I? So I am a school leaver. I arrived at university when I was 18. Uh, I studied in a state school in East London. Uh, I completed A-levels in economics, chemistry, maths and biology. Uh, I didn't really know if I wanted to pursue medicine or whether I wanted to uh, go down the economics maths pathway, uh, but I'm very uh, glad that I chose um, medicine in the end. I had one offer for medical school, Barts in the London, uh, but I applied to uh, four other universities at so Cambridge, UCL and King's. Uh, my backup was biochemistry. Uh, and I've also lived out for my first year of medical school and intermittently throughout the six years, we have clinical placements at a variety of hospitals in Essex uh, and the medical school fund you uh, to live there. So I've also had some short periods of living out from years two to year six, but I've lived at home for the most part. Uh, next slide, please. So life as a, a preclinical medical student, so that's the first two years of medicine. So Freshers Fortnight, everything kicks off with Freshers Fortnight as always, you make new friends, um, and those friends tend to stick with you over the, the six years of medical school and hopefully beyond as well. Um, I went to an all boys secondary school, so it felt slightly weird to be next to girls in a lecture theatre, but you get used to it. Uh, and then I had lots of exams. Um, so fundamentals of medicine here at Barts anyway is after, I believe, three months of lecture based and problem based learning. And that sort of eases you into uh, uh, sitting exams at medical school and throughout your first year you're learning different techniques about how to revise uh, unlike school I found that it was much more you know independent learning you were given a, a problem-based learning activity to do you have to go home uh, go to the library research that particular patient case and then present it uh, to your colleagues uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in a in a group and then Barts is an integrated course. So in the first two years, you also have a variety of different clinical placements as well. So in first year, you have something called Medicine and Society. Uh, and I, I know the curriculum is changing, but for my year, it was once every two weeks. Uh, and I completed mine at a GP practice in first year. And you get to meet a variety of different patients. Uh, and in my second year, my medicine and society placement was at Mile End Hospital, and that was in psychiatry. Uh, and uh, that was very interesting because you meet um, patients um, from, I, I was in adolescent psychiatry and also in um, adult psychiatry. Uh, and I find mental health disorders quite interesting. So that was a quite a unique placement for me to go to. At the same time, you do have some, uh, you, you're not always working, you can also, uh, you know, be employed on the side. So I tutored GCSE and A-level students and I had some fun too. So I'm part of the, I was part of the drama society as an undergraduate and um, I'm not very sportsy. Uh, so I don't really do any sports, but I know there's lots of sports societies here at Barts as well. Uh, next slide, please. So after my first two years, um, I pursued an integrated BSc project, uh, sorry, integrated BSc degree uh, so an integrated BSc is essentially a sandwich year um, where you can do a full three-year degree in one year. Uh, so instead of doing a five-year MBBS course, that then extends to six years. And you can do any, 
there are quite a few integrated BSCs that you can choose from, uh, all the way from endocrinology to medical education to global health. But I decided to pursue neuroscience, and I did that after my first two years at Barts. But some people decide to do that after third year or fourth year as well. Um, so the best part why I chose neuroscience, because I was always passionate about uh, the brain, and um, the BSc was an opportunity for me to learn more about the brain. Uh, and it was the first time that I'd worked in a lab setting as well. And that photograph uh, on the right hand side of the screen is just a picture of uh, me and a few of my uh, lab partners. The BSc teaches you a lot of different research skills. Um, it was the first time I'd worked in a lab, so I got to um, know how a lab works. Um, and it was quite a contrast to working in a hospital setting. And that BSc is also an opportunity for you to meet new friends as well. But it's not all work. So again, I did uh, some, I was employed on the sides. I worked as a widening participation uh, ambassador here at Barts in the London. And I was also in the Drama Society as well. Next slide, please. So that was our integrated BSc graduation. Uh, I, unfortunately, we're not having a summer graduation this year, uh, given uh, the situation, but hopefully there'll be one in uh, January. But I did have that integrated BSc graduation that I look back at uh, very fondly. So those are all my classmates who also pursued neuroscience alongside me. Next slide, please. So after the first two years, uh, you then pursue, you then go into your clinical years as a medical student. So that's your year three, year four, and year five. So unlike the first two years, there tends to be very little lecture-based teaching and uh, problem-based te problem learning doesn't play that much of a role anymore, although it does have a small role. Um, it's mostly clinical placements. So you get to wear your stethoscope at last. Uh, and so in third year, for now, anyway, I, I know the curriculum is changing, but your first block, uh, for me anyway, was cardiology, respiratory medicine, and then hematology, so that's uh, blood. And I did that at Whips Cross Hospital. And then in my second block of, of nine weeks, I uh, pursued a gastro rotation and general surgery rotation as well. And that was at Newham Hospital. Uh, but remember, you don't, you won't necessarily go to Newham Hospital. It's just a... Um, a teaching hospital that you can be put at, but you can go to a variety of different hospitals in London and Essex. And then in my third block, uh, I was at Queen's Hospital in Romford, where I uh, was on the endocrinology and renal or kidney ward. So third year was the opportunity for uh, us to put in practice what we'd learned in the first two years. And it was it was great to finally see all of those clinical conditions that I'd read in the books finally, you know, put out right in front of me where I could actually see them. Um, and it was also that when I felt like a, a real doctor, if you will, and the first time I felt like I was studying medicine, um, because I got to, we got to speak to patients, we got to talk to their families, we got to look at them holistically, uh, so their family background and write up reports uh, and really be part of that uh, multidisciplinary team. So then after third year, you have fourth year, and that's the, as Dr. Robson has um, mentioned, it's the, the specialty year. So as opposed to general medicine, which is third year, uh, you go into learning about things that range from obstetrics and gynecology to pediatrics to neurosurgery. It's all the very specialist um, modules. Uh, fourth year is notoriously difficult um, I think apparently it's second and fourth year meant to be the most difficult years of medical school. Um, I found it, I think, quite a challenging year as well, um, simply because there are so many rotations and the rotations are also quite complex as well. And then after fourth year, you then have final year and that's preparing for, for practice. So that simply wraps up the entire of your medical course. Um, and in fifth year, you go for now anyway, you go to the emergency department to do a rotation there. You also do a bit of anesthetics work uh, and um, some general medicine as well. Uh, and then you have finals. And then after finals, you go on your elective. Unfortunately, given the, the circumstances this year, um, there was no elective. But normally, the elective is an opportunity for medical students to go abroad 
and to experience help to 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 to, to see uh, how a, a healthcare system in a different country operates. And um, so my plan was to go to South America, um, but unfortunately uh, couldn't go this year. But um, I would have spent three months uh, in South America. But the medical school also have a lot of uh, um, research grants. So as a medical student, you can also pursue uh, a research sabbatical uh, in a different country uh, during the summer vacation after, you know, first, second, third or fourth year. So after fourth year, I actually visited Pakistan because I'm originally from there. And I worked in um, at the National University of Medical Sciences um, for about seven weeks, where I pursued some research uh, related to tuberculosis. Uh, next slide, please. So on the side, so not everything is work, work, work. You also have time to explore your other interests as well. So uh, the BARTS has a variety of different um, it called? Uh, periods that, sort of, that are put into the into the curriculum where you can explore a bit more about medical research. So I worked at the Wingate Institute, uh, which is a neurogastroenterology unit at the Blizzard Institute. And my sort of research interests are in uh, the relationship between the brain and the gut. And that was part of my student selected component. Uh, and I was very fortunate to have uh, one of my articles put on the front cover of the Journal of Anatomy. So anything is possible at medical school. And um, we have a, a fantastic research department, uh, research, we're, I think we're ranked amongst the top five in the UK for research. So if that's something that you want to do, then uh, this really is the place to be. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Is that it? Hi, that's the end of the talk. Okay, brilliant. Okay. Um, I know that you wanted to talk a bit about your podcast as well. Oh, yeah. So I, I do have a podcast, which I started about uh, two weeks ago. It's just talking about my life as a medical student, um, the highs and the lows and what I've learned uh, on the journey. Um, it, so my latest podcast, which was released yesterday, was talking about my most informative academic failures, because I know as medical students, as as doctors, we don't generally enjoy talking about failures, um, but hopefully, and I've received some positive feedback so far, and that might be something that people would be interested in listening to. And I'm on Spotify and also Apple Podcasts, uh, and uh, my name is Candid Medic. So if you're interested to follow that, please uh, take a listen. Thank you. Great, thanks a lot, Mossy, and that was a really inspiring talk that you just delivered. Um, so we're going to move on to the questions. So if anyone has any questions related to Mohsin's talk or anything that he mentioned in his talk, then feel free to ask him any questions or queries that you might have. Yep. Um, so I've reset um, the question. So if you can uh, submit your questions now. Yep. Sorry, so how can you do your, your elective year abroad? Um, so you can do your elect so elective is after fifth year as your final year. It's a three month block, but it is now anyway. And you can choose to do it in the UK or abroad. If you're, if you're planning to do it abroad, you have to ensure that you've got a clinician in a different country who's willing to sign you off for your clinical placement there. Mm -hmm. um, and you can really go anywhere provided it's a, a safe country. Um, Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah I, sometimes, if I'm honest, I mean, their exam periods, it, it can feel very overwhelming. But I think the thing that you learn, though, with time is how to cope with stress. Um, I think in first year, I was, I was more reactive and I was more emotional about, you know, exams and um, and life in general. But as you progress through medical school, you eventually realize that you, you find hobbies, you find, you know, um, ways to deal with stress. So over time, I think it, it, it starts to become less overwhelming. Uh, the pastoral support is absolutely brilliant, actually. Uh, Bart's is fantastic for that. Um, uh, there's all we have. Um, so head of years, we have there's head of year for every single year. 
and they're always available to talk to. We also have an academic, I think it's called, um, uh, there is a special pastoral unit uh, at the medical school uh, and you can book meetings uh, with advisors if you want to. Um, so student support. That's it, student support. That's it, student support office. So there is always support at hand for people. Uh, so how much, so a few questions there. So how much stress and pressure are you put under the entire course? Um, not, I mean, it's not overwhelming. Um, it, looking back, it, 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 looking in retrospect, that is. At the time, maybe it felt a bit overwhelming. But as I said, with time, you learn how to manage stress and you develop you know, coping strategies. So, and when you talk by Dr. Robson, yes, uh, she was a very, very good lecturer. Um, I still go turn to some of her preclinical lectures when I'm confused about some aspect of, of medicine. So, uh, yeah, brilliant lecturer. Uh, thanks very much. A uh, few books to recommend to read. Um, so for, for my um, personal statement, I included two books. So the first one was NHS PLC, which talks about uh, the privatisation of the NHS. Uh, and then my second book was Why We Get Sick by Ness. Um, uh, but I, I wouldn't focus too much on, um, you know, putting too much about books in your personal statement. It should be more about a reflection of why you want to pursue uh, medicine. So, um, but those were two books that I read when I was applying to medicine. We'll skip through a few questions uh, because so uh, we can give everyone a, an opportunity. Um, can you describe an average week at medical school? I'm not sure if you can show us a timetable, but just describe an average week. So it depends on what year you're in. Yeah. Uh, but if you're in first year, though, uh, granted the curriculum is currently changing. But for me, it was um, PBLs, I believe, every Tuesday and Thursday uh, for about two hours every afternoon and then there were lectures from around 9 to 2 or 3 p.m. every day um, apart from Wednesday because that went on Wednesday I think it's a you know a London-wide thing or a UK-wide thing where universities um, aren't allowed to teach after 1 p.m. so that students can uh, go off and do sports uh, and we also had anatomy and dissection as well and also um yeah um in terms could you expand a bit about pbl because um most people wouldn't have done it before how does that normally run yeah so um pbl stands for problem-based learning so that's where you're you work alongside a group of eight or nine medical a group a group of medical students and you have a facilitator in the group as well, which is going to be either a clinician or a researcher. And you're presented with a case, a clinical case, on a patient with a particular problem. And you have to, as a group, brainstorm um, different learning objectives, so what you want to get out of uh, this particular case. So, for example, um, what, is, what, 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 what is the disease caused by? What, what are the risk factors? this particular disease how would you manage the disease uh, and a lot of that information you can get from lectures so uh, lectures support your pbls and then two or three days later you then regroup uh, with your facilitator again and then you discuss what you learned um and um yeah so it's, it's quite an interactive way of learning which is supported by lectures Just bear with me. Oh, just one moment. I think we'll end it there. Uh, thank you very much, Mosin. Thank you. Thanks. Well, just... So, Zibad, would you like to introduce the next talk? 
Okay. Um, so in terms of our next talk, uh, yeah. we have... So yeah. we're now moving on to our final... Hello? Yep, so we're now moving on to our final speaker and um, it, with regard to talking about... Can you hear me? Um, I think your internet's cutting out. Um, I will introduce the, um, uh, Professor Kuma. Um, I think uh, you have some internet issues on your end. Um, so, uh, sorry about that, guys. Um, so, the next talk will be a career in medicine uh, by Professor um, named Parveen Kuma, uh, DBE. Uh, she is the SAMDA staff president and former president of the British Medical Association and Royal Society of Medicine. Right, can I start? Uh, yep, just bear with me while I'll bring up your slides. Uh, yep, whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, it's lovely to be here, and it's been lovely also listening to all the other uh, talks so far. Um, and I think I'll just start off by congratulating both Murray and... Uh, Mosin for having qualified. I mean, that is lovely. There's nothing nicer for us teachers to see our, our young when they come in from school develop and actually uh, leave us as uh, high flying doctors, we hope, uh, in the future. So it's been lovely and very many congratulations. Um, so we've had a fairly good look at both dentistry and medicine. And what I really want to talk to you about is really how all this fits in with, with, with life and what's going on around us. And just as you've got that slide up here, can I just point out that the, uh, the little book on the right, it's a little booklet there, thank you, um, for being, uh, is actually been written by 126 medical students from all over the world. Now, just my idea of getting everybody together and hearing what's happening in, in countries in the low uh, middle income countries. And then the next slide will show you the book on the left, uh, which has just come up, and it's called Clinical Medicine. And this started at Bath many years ago and is now really used as a, a, a textbook in most, well, many, uh, almost most uh, uh, medical school, uh, schools around the world. Next slide. So really, we've got lots of questions. We've been asking all the right questions for what it's like to be a doctor or a dentist. Uh, and the question now is, where do you want to practice? What do you want to do? How do you specialize? And really also what's happening around the world around you? So let's just go through those. So the first, the next slide. Um, next slide. Right, so if you look at the left, uh, thank you. You can bring that one up as well. Um, in the olden days, the doctor and his patient, uh, if we didn't know very much medicine really, we didn't know what to do. We could go along and feel the pulse. And then on the second slide there, as you can see, we can sit by the patient as the patient is ill and either will die, or in this particular case, is a little child having pneumonia. And you get to a period where you get the crisis where it suddenly resolves and the patient starts talking again and it's all fine. And then on the right-hand side, next slide, it's really what life is like now. And I think it's already been mentioned uh, by, by Dr. Robson that life is really getting quite complicated. Uh, we've got a lot of advanced technology. Uh, we've also now managed to, uh, we've got the whole genome sequenced, but uh, we also have uh, projects like the 100,000 Genome Study, which is led from BART and also the uh, UK Biobank. And in fact, we've got everybody's genes and we can now really work out how we can give tailored medicine, uh, depending on your gene, whether you like to respond to a drug uh, or whether you have a particular uh, abnormality. And in fact, certainly on the 100,000 Genome Project, which, which I, I also am one of the committees on, you know, we managed to feed this back to the patients and, and actually improve them so the next generation wouldn't have this problem. So there was a, an article in the, an editorial about 20 years ago, all right, which said on the left, medicine used to be simple, ineffective and safe. But to the right, and that's the sort of the time you're going to be living in, it is now complex, 
effective but can be very dangerous. And that's the problem because we've got so much now to, you know, we've worked out so many things. We really now need to be certain that we are, we are doing the right thing for the right patient. Uh, next slide. And let me just tell you, I think uh, Dr. Robson mentioned how medicine is changing. Well, it is changing. So when I was a little girl, like, like all of you are going to be little boys and girls, um, previously on the left-hand side, you know, if you had a peptic ulcer, we put you to bed, you know, would have stuck a tube down your done a barium to find out you had an ulcer. We'd give you antacids. And then we didn't know what to do. We thought it was all due to acids. So we operated. We took a bit of your stomach out. So you got less acid. And there's a picture of an uh, endoscopic picture. So I put tubes down people. Endoscopic picture of an ulcer there. And, and thank you. It looks very good. Now, now we know it's got nothing to do with acid. It's a little bug called Helicobacter pylori. And this bug, uh, which uh, lives in, 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 uh, in, in, the, in the stomach and the duodenum, will actually uh, cause all the ulcers. So now we know that all the ulcers, peptic ulcers, are probably all related to this bug. And if you eradicate the bug, it goes away. Uh, and there are very few instances where it won't be related to the bug when it could be related to taking an analgesic, a painkiller, on an empty stomach. And it kind of, you know, bores a hole into your stomach and you get an ulcer there. And then, of course, the ulcers that don't get better, we've got to be worried about because there may be cancer. Next slide. Uh, and then what do you do with a heart attack? In my day, when I was a little girl, we put you to bed for three weeks. Then we gradually mobilize you for another three weeks. And then we tell you to go off work for three to six months, saying, don't do too much exercise, you might die. You know, it's awful. But now, the minute you get it, uh, we will get you in, we'll uh, put some dye in, do an angioplasty, stretch it or put a stent in, or we can give you thrombolysis uh, uh, if we haven't got that. Then we give you some medication, tell you to exercise a bit more, eat better, and lifestyle changes, and you're fine. So you're out of hospital within a few days. Next slide. So things have changed enormously, and also there are now new diseases coming on the scene, particularly, for example, we're all getting obese. A third of the population here is now obese, and with that comes diabetes and all the other problems that we may get. Now, this is really a slide which shows you really all the sort of things we would do to become a good doctor. Now, clearly, if you look at the left and the top right, you need to get your basic sciences right. And then you add in, uh, you know, what it might look like under the microscope, what the pathology is, uh, and compare that to, to a normality. Now, when you've got a picture of that, then on the left uh, uh, bottom, you look at now the clinical skills. So you now know how to communicate and have clinical skills to actually work out uh, what's going on. And along with that then comes a pattern recognition. So you, know, you have a series of the symptoms and you can then do a series of, of tests and you have this pattern recognition, you know what, what it's going to be. But in all this, and I think one or two uh, people have mentioned it, research plays a major part. And you can actually take that up as a major career or it, it, whatever you do, you need to know how to read journals, and how to actually interpret them for the future. Next slide. So what can you do when you qualify? Okay, so uh, I think Dr. Robson told you various things you could do. So you could either go into general practice, which is a slightly shorter career, uh, but again, both everything you do is going to be lifetime, as everybody's mentioned today. Or you can go into hospital medicine, uh, where you do either medicine or surgery. You could take up radiology, which is looking at x-rays. You can look down the microscope and be a pathologist. Uh, you can become an academic uh, in, in medicine, or you can do anesthetic. So there's other orthopedics, all sorts of specialties you can do. But also, having qualified, you just don't need to be um, in hospital. You can become a, a work for a drug company. You can become a flying doctor. You can work on a, uh, on a boat. And I remember once somebody persuaded me to go on a, on a, on a boat trip over a weekend, a boat trip to Queen Elizabeth. Uh, and I, uh, I think I'd heard, injured my knee or something, so I hobbled around. So I went into the, um, the uh, medical facilities to see you know, what they were like and just ask the nurse whether I could see a doctor just to show me around. And out came the doctor, looked at me and said, hi, prof, and it was one of my students. So there he was on QE2 to looking after 2,000 um, patients and of course, he'd had the norovirus uh, previously and just told me how they had several deaths, but he coped with it all. 
because he had all the wherewithal to, to cope with from medical school. Next slide. Right, so, so now having qualified, you want to really decide what you want to do. Most of us will do clinical work, and as you heard, it could be in hospital, in general practice, or elsewhere. But also, you will all be teaching. So whether you're teaching uh, as a medical student, you'll be teaching your medical students below you, uh, and we do that at Bart's, or you'll be teaching your juniors, uh, and of course, you'll be learning yourself uh, with CPD from your consultants. Or you can do research, and you can take an academic career, or you can get a mixture of all three, which is really what I did. So when I was a fairly young doctor uh, doing my, my uh, MD or PhD, I would be doing research, and then gradually I went back to clinical work. Uh, and then, of course, the teaching carried on uh, all the way through. And then, of course, I started writing books because I just thought that the current text that I was using wasn't good enough. So I just wanted to make one which was much more approachable. Um, and then as a clinician, uh, you start off um, you know, as a junior, but you grow through the stages. And even as a consultant, there are lots of other things you can do. You can um, do um, local committees. Uh, and of course, you've got to sit on committees to be able to make things better. Or you can do national committees like you do. Or you can be presidents of various things, as I've done as well. If you go on to the next slide, thank you. So what do you do as a consultant? Well, um, as you've already heard, you do ward runs. So you look at your inpatients, you follow them around. They'll come in ill either from the GP or from uh, emergency department. Um, and you, you walk through them, get them better, and then send them home. And then you may want to follow them up in, uh, as outpatients, so you might get new patients and outpatients. And that's really following up to see how you are. And in fact, at the moment, because of the COVID thing, we've been doing quite a lot of virtually. Uh, and it seems to work just as well. And it just seemed to me, why do, weren't we doing this, this before? And if you know the patient, you don't really have to see them. You can do it by Zoom or by, by um, other means. Then as I'm a gastroenterologist, in other words, I look after gut and I see that Mosin did his, his um, special study module in, in gut, as, gut and the brain as well. Um, so I do endoscopy. So I put tubes down people or I put up tubes down people. And for the dentist, I'm afraid I bypass the, the mouth. The only question I want to ask the dentist or the patient is, I hope a tooth doesn't fall out because if it falls out, they could aspirate it. So be very careful about their teeth. And then you would have time on, on take. In other words, you would be taking patients from casualty or ED, as we call it. Um, and um, so that particular time, they'll all be coming into your ward and they'll be then uh, triaged into uh, other places. You do acute medicine as well. Now, when you have a patient, you clearly need to have everybody on board. So you have regular meetings. Uh, you have x-ray meetings on the patient's um, x-rays histology meetings where you look down the microscope and see what sort of pathology they've got. Um, you would do audits to make sure you were doing the right thing. And if you weren't, then you would uh, put in other things. We have lots of um, students doing audits for us. And of course, it's now a multidisciplinary work. So you actually uh, have everybody coming in and telling you all about it. Uh, so you work in a team. So you might get the physiotherapist, the occupational therapist, everybody there to discuss a particular patient. Next slide. So here you are, the teamwork. So on, on the left, I'm doing a ward round. Uh, we're using paper there, uh, but now we use uh, the um, we, we use a computer which walks around with us. And you can see there, there's a nurse, there's a junior doctor, there's a, a SHO or registrar there, and there is a uh, physiotherapist. So all very important that we give the best to our patients. And then on the right, you can see I'm actually teaching a, a, a how to endoscope. I'm teaching a, a registrar behind me. But the person who was taking the photograph was actually the student who was actually also learning uh, what we did uh, when we were uh, endoscoping. Next slide. Keep going. Thank you. So if you were doing academic, yeah, keep going so we get to the end of the slide. Uh, you can become a, a um, uh, an academic. Stop the whoops. Right. Um, so you can follow the academic rates. So when you become a foundation person, in other words, as you qualify, as, as um, most of them will be doing, you could actually apply for an academic foundation, an AFP, where you do a, a, a session in ac academia. 
but also as a medical student, we have a, a, a research uh, mon uh, mentor who, if you were interested in research, we could follow you through with that and really keep you through. We did that when we call them as Wal Walport um, researchers, um, uh, students who are interested in research. Um, so you could do, as I said, either clinical and research together. So quite a lot of your research could be done on patients, uh, obviously with ethical approval and the patient's consent. Uh, and it has to go through committees and so on. Or you could just do research and become a laboratory researcher and perhaps uh, work out the genome or something. But all of this is very rewarding to my mind. And of course, if you carried on in research, you could become a Nobel Prize winner. And in fact, Barts in London had a, a student who was then also a registered staff from Barts who got the Nobel Prize uh, a year ago. Um, and his work was really on um, hypoxia and what it did to you. In other words, a low oxygen tension in the body and the sort of mechanisms, cellular mechanisms uh, that, that are involved there. Next slide. But this is all very well. But let's just go on. Next slide. Uh, please remember what's going on in the rest of the world. Uh, you know, I'm a gastroenterologist. And how can I get up in the morning thinking that 2.25 million uh, die, mainly children of diarrhea, which is, you know, we can change it. We can, uh, we can do something about that. Infectious diseases. And, of course, with, with the climate change, those are going to get up again. Malnutrition. I mean, we have – and the problem with, with um, many countries – is you get things just right, and then the poverty, then the, somebody has a war, uh, you know, fighting fractions, and you're back again with the poverty and the problems you had before. Remember, um, uh, you know, very luckily because I wrote that textbook, um, I've been invited to lecture in the world that I was in my bureau once. And I, it really came back affected seeing that they had everything, and everything had been destroyed by war. I mean, how tragic. It's not the politicians who benefit. Uh, well, the politicians benefit because it's all about money, but the patients and and the, and the um, people who actually suffer badly. Next slide. And of course, malaria. We still haven't cured it. We keep finding out vaccines, etc. But you know, five hundred million are affected, and of course, travelers as well. Uh, so we need some research on that. And and uh, I, I thought there was a vaccine development. It's not been uh, ratified yet. Next slide. And then I just mentioned climate change here uh, a, a moment ago, and I think that is going to have a mammoth, mammoth effect on all of us. The world is getting hotter, and unfortunately, if you just put the next slide on, it's the poor um, who will suffer. Uh, and with this climate change, you're going to get floods, storms, damage. I mean, we've had the most extraordinary weather here, so you can imagine what's going on elsewhere. And of course, pests are climate sensitive and infectious disease as well. But tragically, the, the hot countries get the worst. And for example, a one degree, just a one degree loss in uh, uh, rise in temperature will go to sort of seven million tons of wheat uh, being uh, lost, in, for example, in India. Uh, but, you know, with this COVID business, we've had, I mean, again, a, a ghastly pandemic, a lot of people suffering. Uh, but, you know, the shutdown managed to reduce the, um, the pollution in the air by quite a lot. But unfortunately, I think we won't learn. It'll all go back again. But if we've got 12 years to bring that, uh, uh, make sure the temperature doesn't ri ri rise above 1.5 degrees. If we go above that, we've got, we've got major problems. So this is a real, real problem. Uh, and we're, you know, lots of us are working on it. And there's the United um, UK Health Alliance on Climate Change, uh, which I'm an ambassador for, where we're trying desperately hard to see how we can produce waves or ways of uh, reducing the um, the pollution. Next slide. So being a doctor, it's hard work. It is stressful, but as as uh, Mosin said, you know you can do other things. There's uh, a lot of um, things to keep your mind away from the stress and de-stress yourself by going to running and do gym or just get a hobby. Uh, it does, of course, has huge responsibilities. And I think, remember, you want your, your, your altruism, you want your compassion, but as well as that, you've got to work on and uh, make sure that you uh, revalidate and keep up your um, interests and your, your uh, 
uh, knowledge of medicine. Uh, professional, you've got to be professional all the time, looking after your patients. Next slide. Uh, and I think it's been mentioned several times. I think Jay, uh, Dr. Berry mentioned it, and um, let's say it's a lifetime job. It's not a job, it's almost a vacation. It is a vacation for me, certainly. And it's been the most enjoyable vacation I've had because I can't think of anything better than to have had this wonderful career as being a doctor. So it has great rewards in, in bringing, uh, being able to help patients. And I think one, one of the things that I always say, that the, the best thing that I can really ask for is when the patient has the leave saying, thank you, doctor. You know, that's all you want. Somebody just saying thank you to you as, as they walk out of the door. And you feel you've done a reasonably good job. But also it's great fun. I mean, you've got a huge community. Wherever you go around the world, if you're a doctor, you are, you know, you carry that title with you. Uh, but uh, people respect you. And of course, you've got to make sure you don't don't abuse that respect and, and uh, keep to this sort of professionalism uh, tenants that we hold. Uh, but it is great fun. And uh, as you heard from the students, uh, they had a great time in, in medical school. And I hope they will have the great time again. Uh, thank you. I think that's the last slide, is it? Is there another slide? Yep, that's the end of the talk. Okay, so good luck to all of you, and I'm sure you will. And I think, can I just answer one other question? Um, somebody was asking how, uh, you know, in these uh, close-up days, how can you actually have a work experience? And just fortunately, somebody um, emailed me yesterday, a chap called Mark Scott, who is actually working on virtual uh, work experience. And... Uh, Moby and I've, I've asked him to send me the the tag when he gets it. So if I gave it to you, you could perhaps pass it around to all the others who've uh, yep. logged in today. Sure. Um, we've at, we've actually made a lockdown edition booklet, so we can add that to uh, the booklet, which gives um, students specific advice on how to um, uh, carry out um, the application process um, through lockdown and the whole COVID-19 situation. So we'll add that link. Brilliant, thank you for that. Great, thank you, Professor Kumar, for that incredibly insightful and informative presentation. Again, we're gonna move on to the Mentimeter platform. And uh, if you guys can ask any questions you might have to Professor Kumar, Kumar. and we can start answering those. All of the qualities of a good doctor and dentist. I um, think so that was a question. Just bear with me one moment. All right, okay. Is um, that a question or not? Um, let's have a look. Yeah, the questions are now up. Okay, well, a lovely question. If you just like the content of biology and chemistry A level, do you think choosing medicine and university is a good choice? Well, I think the answer possibly is no. Uh, we certainly like a chemistry A level uh, because a lot of what you do is related to chemistry. Uh, and you'd have to know a little bit about that. Biology, you can probably learn, but I think uh, to have both of those would be a, a very good start. Thank you. So what are some of the differences in how medical schools, schools outside of London work? Well, I think all, as I think Leslie Robson said earlier, all the medical schools are have to teach according to the GMC guidelines. We know we all have the same sort of things. But the difference between London and, and the, the, uh, the more um, peripheral um, medical schools uh, is marginal. It depends on where you want to work. Maybe you want to work and... and um, learn in, 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 you know, in another, another town. Uh, they all have pros and cons in there. With London, of course, you've got all the things that are going around you. You've got the world visiting you. You've, uh, and I think we're very lucky at Barcelona and London because we send you out to places like the Homerton and um, uh, Newham, uh, where, of course, uh, we have lots and lots of um, uh, ethnic minorities. So you see the world here. You may not see that, for example, if you went to Exeter or somewhere like that, but you have other things to, to, to look after. And I think, as, as Dr. Robson said, look at the 
curricula, look at where it is, go and visit it, and then see what you like. And I think one of the things that I could push past in London is we have a tremendously good uh, staff um, student to says, um, uh, interaction uh, where any uh, student can email anybody and ask, uh, ask for advice or can I come and see you? And we never say no, we always say yes. Thank you. We'll um, skip through a few and then so we get a um, equal. Um, let's have a what is a day, man? I like that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, uh, what inspired me? Um, well, do you know, medicine is, is, is something that you kind of grow into, but I, I wanted two things I wanted science and I wanted to care for patients. Uh, and there's nothing better than uh, medicine for joining those two together. So as I said, I've had a very varied career. I've been, been incredibly fortunate that I've done both the science and the basic science when I was young. And then as you grow older, you know, uh, you move on to other things. So um, the inspiration, I think, was, was uh, you know, obviously who's gone, you know, um, uh, people, your role models from the past. You know, you, you hear about... Um, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, uh, and of course, when I was in medical school, you know, qualified in 1802, I suspect, but what um, uh, there weren't very many women around, so I think you were looking for women role models, and there weren't too many there. So there were probably about eight, six, eight of us with about 160 men, and now, of course, the, the gender balance is much better, easier, and I've had more women going into medicine than men. Okay. Uh, uh, can I just do that? Is it possible to have a family? Yeah. I, I uh, let me just. Yeah. That a lot of uh, people ask, and I and and boys, this is just as more applicable to you as girls. Okay. Um, I think the first thing in your life must be the family. So you've got to concentrate on that, and whether you can get that balance right with work and family. That's up to you and also maintaining that, you, you know, the family comes first. And the answer is, yes, of course, you can have a family. There may be a time, uh, you know, and I see my, my, you know, all the young doctors and young students who maybe have got married earlier, uh, finding it difficult to, to do the two. Um, and I think you hopefully will have a, a, a husband who is, um, uh, you know, will be understanding. And equally for the husband, make sure that you understand the wife who's having that problem with both medics. Uh, so the answer is yes, and you can box and cox. It's a compromise, but you can box and po cox and adequately. Okay. Um, I'll just scroll through a few questions. Just let me know um, of any. Uh, sorry, what was the last one? How do you make sure that you are? How do you make sure that you're just an average doctor? How do you progress to becoming a doctor for the world and making larger difference? So the two questions there. Um, well, if I was an average doctor, I'd be very pleased, but I would like to be the best doctor there was. And uh, you know, as you see your patients, you want to do the best by the patients. So clearly, that is the most important thing to do. Um, how can you become a, a doctor for the world? And can I just say, we're not training you just to be a doctor for um, the United Kingdom or you know, for England or, or Scotland or Wales or Ireland. We're training you to be doctors of the world. And I think you have to see out. And I think the pandemic has shown us that what happens in a country thousands of miles away can affect us here. So we need to talk to neighboring countries. And I, I know, for example, when uh, I've been to Africa many, many times, but the WHO looks at the neighboring countries so if they get a, an alert that some disease is coming up there they inform the other countries so you can actually prepare so you will be doctor for the world and if you wanted to go out it'd be much better that you went out and saw what it's like in your electives as uh, Mosin was talking about he's going to South America you'll see some of that there uh, uh, I think to go to a lower or mid middle income country during your elective is a good idea but also you can take part in global health earlier as a student so you can join places where they have a lot of global health um, uh, projects going on uh, i was uh, president of the royal society of medicine and um, started off the global health program there with um, uh, a, a pediatric cardiothoracic surgeon uh, called b setia 
and we sort of set it in, in, in stone there. But the people who took most part in that were the students. And they're the ones that actually led us and helped us do what we wanted to do. Oh. Yes, how do you psychologically cope with death on the ward? Do you know, that's probably the most difficult thing uh, for several reasons. One is you feel you've done all that work as a doctor and yet here is this patient and you couldn't save them. And the answer is, is um, it's difficult. It's difficult to take when the patient dies. And I think you asked somebody else uh, the question, what is the most difficult thing being a doctor? And I think that is saying goodbye to somebody you just cannot um, actually help. Um, so it's difficult. Um, and it's a question of how much empathy you give, but also how much you've got to stay back and review the situation. Now, if you took part and were empathic, but also get, get totally involved with the patient uh, or the patient's process and so on, you're not going to be able to cope because you're going to have to, uh, you know, you, you die within seconds. So you've got to keep back and keep a little bit of objectivity. One, because I think it makes you a better doctor to be objective about a problem so you can think it through. But secondly, you won't totally kill yourself in your mind. And, and you know, it, it's, uh, you know, you've got to be sane. And you've got to, uh, and I think one of the things that you could do is really talk it over with a friend afterwards or, or with somebody or your parents or, or somebody else, another a doctor. Um, and I think that really helps. And, and one of the things about medicine is that we're all in, in it together and we all want to help each other. And if I could also just put in a, a plug here, I'm also president of the Royal Medical Benevolent Fund. And what we do is to, and it's entirely confidential, if you have a problem and say you get into dire financial difficulties and can't cope, then contact us. The BMA has got a thing going, the British Medical Association, so we do actually help out there as well. But remember, we're all there for together. So when you're a student, we're there to help. We're there to talk about it. So don't please get yourself into a, into a tight corner. Uh, let us help each other. OK. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kumar. Uh, we will um, end it there in terms of questions. Uh, just bear with me. Yep, yep. We'll now be moving on to our last presentation of the evening, which will be delivered by Mr. Robertson, and he will be covering the application process and how to apply for medicine and dentistry at university. Uh, Mr. Robertson, you're muted. Yep, we can hear you now. All right. <laughs> rookie, rookie error. Um, okay, so, uh, <laughs> okay, so I, um, I'm just going to give you an overview about the um, application process for medicine and dentistry. So I will we'll be giving um, our point our point of view from um, Barton and London, what we ask students to get, and I'll also be mentioning other um, things to think about um, if you're applying to other, obviously applying to other universities as well. I'm also going to touch on things that you can do over the summer um, to improve your understanding of medicine and dent dentistry, um, given that the with the current pandemic, there might be slight some issues with your work experience. And then I'm happy to take any questions at the end. Okay, so you've heard already about people's roots into medicine and the kind of progression and things like that. But I'm going to just talk to you about what um, what we ask students to um, get in order to um, get be successful in getting a place um, studying medicine or dentistry. So for medicine, and they are, and I'm, before I forget, they are pretty similar for medicine and for dentistry. Um, so first of all, so the GCSEs that we ask students to get are a minimum of three sevens and three sixes. Um, and that is to include English language, 
maths and science as part of those um, six grades. Other university medical schools may differ in what they ask you to get, but that's what we are asked for. Um, a levels. So in terms of A levels, we ask that students get um, a minimum A star AA, and that is to include two sciences. So that is biology um, or chemistry as one of the options. And then the other science could be biology or chemistry, physics or maths. We also count maths um, as a science for, for our entry requirements. And then the third A level could be um, any A level. So you could do two sciences and you could be really passionate about art or history or something completely different. Um, that is absolutely fine with us. But in terms of other medical schools, they might slightly differ. They might ask that you sit maths or um, other subjects. So please do check um, entry requirements for all the medical schools that you are interested in applying. So other things as well that we ask students to do are um, we ask students to sit the UCAT. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that um, in light of the recent updates in the next um, couple of slides. But for us, we ask the students to get the third decile or higher. And again, the scoring, uh, the exact scores change each year because it depends on how well everyone um, does who sits the test. But if you go onto our uh, admissions web pages, and also if you go on the UCAT website, they will have the scores from the last few years on the different decile ranges. So that should give you an idea of the sorts of scores um, that you should be, be looking at. Um, again, other universities might slightly differ. They may ask you to get certain an average score in all the different sections, or they may, um, again, they may, may ask for a third third decile, it just depends. So please do check what they, um, other medical schools that you're interested in um, want you to get. The other thing as well to bear in mind is we all ask students to get um, some work experience and you will also need to do a personal statement. I'm going to touch on them in a little bit more detail um, later on in this presentation. Okay, so dentistry, these are the roots in dentistry. Again, you've heard from some, um, some of our dentists um, earlier on in the evening. But again, it's the same. We look for the same grades um, as we do for medicine. So it's three sixes, three sevens as a minimum at GCSE um, to include English, language, maths and science. A-levels, again, it's A star, A star AA with two sciences, again, as I've said previously for medicine. And again, the third subject could be something completely different. Um, and again, the UCAT score is also the third decile or above. Um, and any work experience, we would look to get you some work experience um, as well, uh, in a preferably in a kind of dentistry context. But again, healthcare, uh, any sort of healthcare um, experience is useful. But again, I'll go into this shortly. Um, and also, we'll expect you to do a personal statement. Okay, so in terms of the UCAT, so this is key information that you may or may not be aware of. This has just come out, been published this week. So there's some key changes to the, the UCAT for this year. Um, so you can sit the UCAT in a test centre, as, as students could have done in the past, um, or you could sit it at home. Again, there's no there's no difference between the test that you sit at home or in a test centre. The registration opens on the 1st of July and the testing takes place between the 3rd of August and the 1st of October. Please think carefully where you would like to test. So where will you perform best? Some people might like the idea of being at home to do the test. You're in uncomfortable surroundings. You might feel a bit more relaxed. Um, alternatively, most of the time, most of the time when you do tests, you're probably at school in an exam hall, classroom. So perhaps that might get you more in the in in the kind of zone, as it were, to take the test. Um, so just have a little think about that. Um, 
also being being mindful that the you know you need to be mindful of the sort of technological um, capabilities of your um, internet access, also your computer as well. Do they meet the technological requirements to take the test? So again, please check that because you want to make sure that your laptop, your computer, whatever you're using, um, will be kind of will, you'll be able to do the test without any any problems. Um, if you require any access arrangements, again, they can be catered for at home, but these are things the these are things that um, are probably um, kind of much easier um, and much kind of more, yeah, much easier to um, administer um, at the test centres. Um, and so it'd be more benefit, beneficial to you. But again, have a look, have a think. Um, you need to make sure that you have the required ID that you need for the preferred location. Um, and a really good starting point, if you haven't done so already, is look at the UCAT website. Um, so the two, and you need to read the um, guides for the online and also for the test centre. That will give you a really good idea of what you need to um, be aware of, and it will help you make your decision. The UCAT website also has a load of really useful free resources, tips, strategies, practice questions. So that's a really good first place to start with your um, UCAT preparation. What do medical and dental schools look for? So we've touched on that already this evening. Um, Professor Kumar in the, in the previous session um, was talking about, was answering a question about related to this. So for, for us, we want to see students that demonstrate the skills and qualities that you would want to see in your doctor, in your dentist. Um, so these are just some examples. So teamwork, empathy, time management, caring, communication, etc. There's lots of different examples. So this is what we want to see um, you display and have the knowledge of. Also, we want you to have an understanding of the reality of what it's like to work in medicine, in dentistry. It's not easy. It's quite demanding. And there's lots of things to consider. So we want to see that you've um, understood these realities. The commitment to the subject as well, again, we want to see you um, demonstrate that you are committed, um, you're interested in the subject. So this is something that you can um, show by work experience, further reading, um, and then also the self-motivation and confidence. And this again, this is something that should come out through your application. So whether it is in an interview or um, your personal statement or when you're kind of um, undertaking your work experience, this is the sorts of things that that we look for. So how can you demonstrate these? So the first one, uh, the obvious one, work experience. So work experience, so this is something we obviously expect students to do some work experience. Some of you may have got work experience already, some of you may have some plan for later on in the year. So we, um, and we realise that the situation at the moment with the current pandemic is putting having quite an impact on work experience placements. I'm sure a lot of them have been cancelled. You may have work experience that is cancelled um, for the summer. So please do try and get some work experience if it is safe to do, do so. Um, in previous years, we would ask students to have work experience done before the application deadline of the 15th of October. However, this year, if you are struggling to find work experience before that, that is understandable, but um, make a note in your personal statement that you are planning to try and get some later on in the year. So you can keep trying to get some work experience um, later on in the year, even after the deadline. We're saying if you can try and get some before um, the interview start, which is normally for us, it'll be January, February. For other medical schools, it may be December, but it, typically it's sort of in the spring. Um, so the sorts of work experience we're looking for is work experience in kind of any healthcare setting. We understand that it is hard to get work experience in a hospital, GP practice, private dental practice. So any sort of work experience you can get in a healthcare setting is extremely 
valuable. So whether that is volunteering in kind of an elderly care home, you might volunteer in the community. Um, Part-time job is also good experience. You know, it's good experience and practice for kind of skills such as communication, teamwork, um, things like that. There's lots of different places you can get work experience. Um, and I am, I am aware that at the moment um, that there is, you know, trouble getting work experience. So the sorts of things that you can start to do um, is have a look, if you haven't already, so the Medical Schools Council and the Dental School Council have both released statements in relation to COVID-19 and its impact on work experience. And these are really, really useful documents um, to give you some really useful um, directions, some useful places that you can start to do some more um, kind of uh, get some more experience, improve your understanding of medicine and dentistry. Um, and there is some useful links to online resources, um, such as the Royal College of GPs, um, Observed GP program. So make sure you read these statements and use this pandemic as an opportunity to improve your understanding of medicine or dentistry. Yes, it may be it may make things harder to get in terms of work experience, but there's a lot of opportunity to improve this your understanding of medicine and dentistry. And this is what we would look for students to do. So if you're but unable to get work experience, you still have this, this understanding that, I've been, that we've been talking about. So how can you do this? So you can research about current issues, about the COVID-19 um, pandemic. And then when you research it, thinking of, link it back to the realities of working in healthcare, being a doctor, being a, a dentist, at this present time. It can also, all the reporting of the current pandemic can tell you a lot about the realities um, of, the, you know, of the profession and the sorts of skills, attributes, characteristics that are needed. Again, so make, and make sure that you self-reflect and you write notes um, about this. So where, you can research, where can you research about current issues? So there's lots and lots of newspaper articles. The NHS behind the headlines, there's BBC, there's podcasts, documentaries, films, books, journals. There's a lot of information out there that you can draw upon to improve your understanding of medicine and dentistry. You can use this for your personal statement and for your interviews. Articulate what you learn to another person. Like I said, write it down, but also um, talk about these sorts of issues, what you learn to other other people, because it can help you um, articulate, articulate yourself <laughs> um, and help with your understanding. And again, this is all good practice for your interviews. So things to bear in mind when you're looking at the current issues, look for a variety of sources. So there's normally lo lots of different quotes, whether it's from MPs, health professionals, um, Look for kind of what they said, common themes, where did they differ? What else is qu quoted in these acts, reports, research, etc.? It gives you more of an insight into the issues that underlie the overall issue. And what's the purpose motivation of these sources? The opposition, so Labour, wouldn't um, really come out in full support of the government, perhaps. E, um, they would perhaps focus in on the areas that they didn't support. Um, and again, journalists um, can be like this too. Um, again, if you you need to practice getting to you know getting um, behind the kind of argument and really understanding this, because if you mention things like this in your interview, you'll probably get follow-up questions asking you um, about these. So we've talked about um, skills and characteristics, attributes, um, read this document, this MSC core values to study medicine, it will help you um, identify these important skills, these characteristics that we look for in medical students. Um, again, it can help inform you with your kind of your research and, and current issues and with reflecting on your work experience. 
Dentistry students look at the GDC's nine principles of registered dental professionals. The NHS core values is an incredibly useful um, set of values um, to read. Again, this is for medicine for dent and for dentistry students. You don't have to know all these things off by heart, but it give, if you have an idea of them, it can certainly help you, like I said, reflect on your work experience, but also with your understanding of um, medicine and dentistry. So personal statement, just a quick bit on the personal statement. Um, so you've done all this work experience, you've been reading about um, medicine and dentistry and thinking about it in relation to the, the current pandemic. Um, so one place you can start to put this information is your personal statement. It's only about one side of A4 paper. Um, so you need to, this is how you would look to structure it. So you want to include why you are interested in studying medicine or dentistry, any work experience or volunteering that you've done, or if you've done, if you struggle to get work experience, what have you read about uh, medicine and dentistry? What's your understanding of it? If you've done anything, what areas of your academic study particularly interest you that link to medicine or to dentistry? And you might want to bring in some hobbies that interests as well towards the end and write a short conclusion. That's just a quick summary because I realise I'm running out of time. But there are um, there is more useful information um, on our um, widening participations team online outreach hub which has lots of different courses that link to the application process, including personal statements. Oh yeah, what, one other thing, when thinking about your work experience, current issues, your personal statement, I've touched on it briefly, please self-reflect. Um, we want to see what you have got out, what have you have learned from this experience, so, or, or the sort of research, the reading that you have done. Um, so self-reflection is incredibly important. Some alternatives to medicine: you get a fifth, you get a fifth sort of, cho ex sort of final choice on your UCAS form. You've applied for four medicine or dental schools. You've got one. Um, so do think about that that final option. Some people. Or look, people won't necessarily get in first first time, um, or meet the entry requirements. So it's really useful to think of that fifth fifth choice. Um, there are graduate entry programs, so we have lots of students that do medicine or dentistry and then and do an undergraduate degree first, and then progress to studying medicine or dentistry after that. So it can give students a really good foundation um, before starting medicine or for dentistry. Um, the future of medicine or dentistry is not only in medicine. There's lots um, lots and lots of scientists have a massive impact on the field of medicine and dentistry. So whether it is designing the latest sort of technology used in kind of theatres, in hospitals, or whether it is developing um, drugs that can be used to treat patients or global health practitioners understanding um, the sort of uh, impacts of um, issues to do with medicine or, or dentistry. And you might find after doing a bit of more research that medicine is not, or dentistry is not for you, which again is, is fine. Please do do some research about that um, fifth choice. Okay, so finally, what if you don't get in. You've got an insurance choice. So that's that fifth choice like I've mentioned. So you could go on and study um, that degree if you found it really, really interesting. Um, alternatively, you could reapply the following year. Again, we have lots of students that don't get in the first time, but then they reapply. However, you will have to meet the entry requirements. Lots of students that reapply the following year might have not done very well on the UCAT test or um, they might have not um, 
they might have not passed the um, interview stage. Um, students would have to get the, the grades if they were reapplying. Um, and then students can use this year out to get more experience um, to then use in the application process and often are quite successful the following year. Talked about graduate entry already. There's other healthcare and related courses that you can do. And just one final thing, we will not um, accept resits or transfers. So what I mean by resits is that most medical or dental schools, it will be the case that um, we don't accept resets unless it's some really kind of quite big extenuating circumstances. Um, and this, the resits applies to A-levels. The GCSEs for us, you can resit them but not for A-levels. Please do make sure you have um, real ex realistic expectations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Robertson. That was really informative and I'm sure the students would have learned a lot from your presentation. Um, just now, moving on to the questions, we will be having a Q&A session for anyone that has questions regarding Mr. Robertson's presentation. However, in the interest of time, we've decided not to host the general Q&A session. Instead, if you guys have any further questions, then feel free to email us at samda uh, at bartslondon.com and then we'll be more than happy to answer your questions there. So yeah, we're opening up Mentimeter now for any questions from Mr. Robertson regarding the application process. Good question. You you will still have to meet um, the the requirements, even if it is one. So if you haven't got that one subject. Um, there's so many people applying that we um, we ha we expect everyone to have the the requirements. We would expect you to do, we would expect you to have work experience from the current year that you are applying, but you can certainly draw on. Um, previous work experience um, in your kind of in your interview. Yes, part-time jobs are are good to mention. Are good to mention. Like I said, skills um, and characteristics, things like teamwork, communication, time management, are really good. To demonstrate. Uh, oh yeah, I should have I should have mentioned that actually. That's a good question. So for um, balancing personal statements, so applying for your fifth choice, you don't have to write about that in your personal statement. Don't worry about writing that. Just focus on medicine or dentistry. If the university that you're applying to for your fifth choice is um, what wants you to write a personal statement, they'll get in touch with you. Good question. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not going to guess. All right. Any other questions? Um, what we can do for that is if you email us in and then we can um, d um, investigate that further. Yeah, GCSE, if you do GCSE re resets, that is fine with us. You would have to do your A levels in one sitting. Some do. Some universities will ask you for a reference from the work experience. Some um, don't. It will depend on the university, but they will they will detail that on their web pages and certainly on the medical schools council's list of. Um, courses, they have that information. 
I think we've had that one before. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, one of the, well, I noticed one other question earlier to, in terms about what good resources are available. So, again, like I said, um, the statement from the Medical Schools Council has a couple of links to some online resources. Um, so that is definitely something that um, you should look you should all kind of look at for a good starting point. Um, most university um, web paid uh, sort of education liaison, medical schools, widening participation teams will have information, courses, programs. I mean, so we're working on a range of online content that will be available to prospective students. So one of them that is due to come out in the next couple of weeks is an understanding medicine or dentistry so it kind of goes into a bit more detail about some of the things that i've talked about this evening no unfortunately psychology as far as i'm aware is not a third science well students that are we yeah, um no i think like i said it's what it's making the most of the kind of the current situation people could get lots and lot and also that the being able to self-reflect so lots of students get loads and loads of really good work experience but if they don't self-reflect on it they don't learn from it and convey what they've learned then actually it it kind of doesn't really serve them very well whereas someone can have a couple of bits of work experience but have really really kind of engaged really self-reflected um and that will be just um, just been just as beneficial. So for us, in terms of the, that question, it was about waiting. So in terms of us, so for 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 grades and for UCAT, we weight them 50-50. Um, other universities might do it in a different way. Again, this is something to just check with each university that you're applying. So extracurricular, um, get extracurricular activities can help applications, certainly help applications. I think the thing is, don't just do extracurricular activities just for the sake of it, because if you don't enjoy it, it's going to have an impact on your um, studies, your grades, and that's the kind of most important thing. Um, but certainly extracurricular activities can help like well, like I said with part-time work subject choices so I'm assuming that means a level no as long as you've got two sciences and another a level that's fine with us okay I'm just um, in the matter of time uh, I'm just going to scroll through uh, a few questions um, just stop me at um, the last question you'd like to answer What was that? What was the last one? The previous was it about the coronavirus thing? Okay, so 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 re, so in terms of researching current current issues, um, so obviously the big one at the moment, like I said, is corona the coronavirus. Um, other examples of um, from the last few years. Of current of current issues, so things like in the past there's been sugar sugar tax um, and the impact that this could have on diets on health. You know, we had the junior doctor strike a couple of years ago. Last year there was the NHS long term plan. So every year there's there's lots of different issues um, taking taking place. Um, you know, every year. Um, so if you look in sort of health sections of newspapers or kind of um, like BBC Sky News, that will give you an indication. Um, so, but certainly this year, the big the big issue is um, coronavirus. Okay, thank you very much. And just one more addition. Um, 
to uh, the Malta question. Uh, so in terms of applying to the Malta Medical School, uh, they may drop an, uh, a grade or two compared to London, uh, but you would have to pay the full fees of over um, 23,000 pounds, unlike uh, London, which is 9,250 pounds if you're a UK student. A student. Yeah. Great, thank you Mr Robertson for answering those questions for us. Thank you to everyone for listening to all the presentations and asking some of these brilliant questions. We're now going to be moving on to closing the event and I'm going to hand over to Mubeen and he'll direct you towards the feedback forms and what you can do next from here. Okay, um, just bear with me. Okay, um, sorry about the wait. Um, so I just wanted to add in terms of the UCAT um, summary uh, a bit more information. Uh, all of this information uh, on the slide will also be on the um, SAMDA uh, booklet, Lockdown Edition. Uh, so but as a brief uh, overview of the changes to the UCAT this year, um, we have received these updates last night and further detail uh, details can be found on the website as already mentioned. We have also provided links at the end of the feedback link on the next slide. Uh, so UCAT has made a decision to allow the students to sit the examination either at home or at one of the Pearson View uh, test centres. Um, the opening date for the registration is the 1st of July and the test can be um, uh, can take place between the 3rd of August uh, to the 1st of October 2020. And for individuals wishing to sit the examination at one of the test centres, it will run very similar to previous years, but with all social distancing measures in place. Um, health and safety measures have been taken uh, at all centres, such as the use of hand sanitizers, face coverings, etc. There is more detail about this in the published booklet, uh, as uh, mentioned below um, in the previous talk and you can see on the right hand side of the screen the two booklets um, you must not go in if you have any COVID symptoms um, if you wish you can take the UCAT um, test at home um, just bear with um, but please ensure that you have done all the proper checks. Um, so the list of checks can be found in the new booklet published uh, and the examination will require like a live recording. So anyone under the age of 18 must have a parent or guardian uh, um, who gives consent for this recording to take place. And without this, you may not sit the examination. Uh, in order to ensure the same conditions as the test centers, your PC window will be uh, locked and you uh, will not be able to access any windows. Uh, you must not use any secondary monitors and uh, the UCAT uh, software will be using uh, artificial intelligence with live monitoring during the examination to ensure cheating is prevented. And at the start of the examination, you will meet like a greeter, um, who will be like a member of staff of uh, UCAT, who will inspect your room and ensure the room is fit for examination purposes. purposes. If you do uh, face uh, problems during the examination, such as internet cutting, uh, the proctor or invigilator can reset the exam or re resume it at the point uh, where the exam stopped. Um, although this uh, might have been a lot of information, it is only a brief summary, uh, but and a lot of details can be found on the website. So we do highly recommend that you do check out the website before you book anything, before you sit the UCAT. Um, so we have also attached uh, the SAMDA lockdown booklet uh, at the end of the feedback form, uh, which I'll go on to the, on the next slide, and that can provide some guidance on the UCAT. So please uh, check that out as well. Um, so 
just coming up to the end. Uh, so uh, the SAMDA feedback uh, form. Um, so the survey link here uh, will take you to a Google form. Um, all you have to do is get out your phones uh, and open the camera and you can scan the QR code and it will take you to the feedback form. Or you can um, type in uh, the URL uh, shown on screen. Uh, so it will take you to a Google, Google form and it will have an information sheet at the start of the form if you wish to contribute your answers uh, from the feedback form for a research, a research project that um, our vice president for SAMDA is conducting. And, but if you do not wish to take part, simply answer no to the questions on page one and continue through the general feedback questions and you can still access all uh, uh, the uh, resources. Um, so there are several links found at the end of the survey and that includes the certificate uh, for the, this event so you could add it to your portfolio and just show it as evidence for engagement uh, um, in terms of what you've done to see if um, a medicine or dentistry is the right career for you. Uh, we've also got a SAMDA booklet which is the lockdown edition so this has got specific advice on, uh, on how to um, tackle the application process. It covers things like um, uh, it covers things like UCAT, BMAT, personal statement, how to get work experience during this time. So it covers a lot of different uh, topics specific um, uh, for the situ situation that we're going through. We haven't included uh, um, an interview section as of yet because um, uh, obviously we do not know uh, um, a lot of information of how these will run. So we don't want to give any um false information that might change uh, or, may, or information that might change at a later date, but we will um, send out further guidance. Uh, the next uh, important link uh, at the end, end of the feedback form is um, future um, event sign up. So um, if we go back, um, let me have a look. So these uh, events, okay, so in particular, um, uh, we have uh, the buddy, uh, we have the buddy scheme, we have um, interviews, and we also have skills dates. So uh, we will be running more talks like this. So if you do want to um, uh, uh, attend more talks, please do sign up uh, using the um, the, the future sign up form at the end of the feedback uh, form. Um, another link, uh, I'm sorry, there's a lot of links, but um, please do go through them because uh, it will be very resourceful uh, and hopefully it will help you, is the, um, the buddy scheme. So what we intend to do is if you um, sign up for that, you will be paired with a current medical or dental student who will be able to communicate with you uh, via email uh, but obviously you would have to have your teacher CC'd in, uh, into that email uh, and they can help you uh, with advice for the application uh, process. Um, yeah, and we've also got links to the financial advice uh, that uh, was supposed to be given uh, in the financing degree talk by Ms. Uh, Pollard. Uh, so please do check that out. And finally, we do have links for the UCAT update. So um, do fill in the feedback form. Um, it does take about four minutes to um, fill in, but you'll have uh, access to a lot of resources uh, that will hopefully help you uh, during this time and applying for medicine and dentistry. Um, so that's it for now, but um, we hope that you have learned something today um, and that you will be able to take uh, uh, something back with you. We hope that this event has given you a greater insight into studying medicine or dentistry at university as well as life as a doctor or dentist. And I hope that today's evening also informed you more about the application process and addressed your questions or queries. Uh, so that's pretty much it. What what I will do is, if it's okay, Professor Kumar, um, could I ask for some closing statements from you in term, uh, from our SAMDA co-president? Yes, of course. Uh, our SAMDA staff president, sorry? Yeah, staff, I get it right, get it right, maybe. Uh, no, I, can I just say... Yeah, it's, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Can I just say it's been wonderful uh, um, seeing everybody, and I do... Wish you all great luck in getting into medicine. But also, can I just thank 
uh, the two co-presidents, Mubin and Zebed, and also Gaurav, who's been working in the background, uh, they've done all this in their free time. They've given a huge amount during their medical school years to Samda, which is all about going out to, to schools and helping those who don't know how to get into a, a medical school. Uh, and they have clinicians' evenings. They have uh, clinical uh, sessions where they even show you how to do clinical skills. So lots of things going on. So a big thank from all of us, really, to Mubin, uh, Zibad, uh, Gaurav, and all the other Samda members who've helped. So thank you so much. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And good luck, everybody. Thank you very much. And with that, we will end the talk. Thank you, guys.